This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after 10 is the time and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I do find myself wondering precisely what it is a government with no ideas and, uh, and, and precious little support can do in order to draw attention to itself and make it look like they're actually governing. And this uh, ban upon mobile phones in schools from Gillian Keegan looks like a contender. You will be invited to prove me wrong a little later in the programme. And speaking of a little later in the programme, my favourite story of the day. You know what's just happened, don't you? Yeah, you're right. What is it? Four minutes after ten. It's Monday morning, so I've come up with the idea for a new feature, which I've forgotten about by four minutes after eleven. But my favourite story of the day, I don't even need a jingle. I'm not going through another one of those weeks-long sagas where I try and get a little bit of production put together for my programme but get told it's not possible. You're right at the back of the queue. We're we're, we're too busy dealing with the breakfast show or the news agents or whatever it is. I've I've given up. I've given up on that. So I don't need a jingle. I'll sing it myself. My favourite story of of the day uh, involves something I have suggested to you the police should do to tackle the epidemic of bike thefts. Not, I grant you, the sexiest story in town, unless you've had your bike thefted or thieved recently. But I love this story because it is one of those things that adds to the usually delusional idea that you can sit in a television studio behind a big fat microphone and actually come up with a way of solving problems that apparently have confounded the police. They have now solved a massive problem doing something I told them to do several years ago. Five minutes after 10 is the time. But we begin with the uh, with the latest chapter in the unfolding tragedy of Gaza. So Keir Starmer is the centre of attention today, and I think rightly. His party, the Labour Party in Scotland, has uh, issued a call for an immediate ceasefire. His leader, indeed, in Scotland, Anna Sawa, has openly demanded an immediate ceasefire. This has been backed by Scottish Labour delegates. So the Scottish Labour Party joins the SNP in calling for an unequivocal ceasefire. If such a thing is possible, I I don't know that it can be unequivocal, a a, a ceasefire, because it is highly unlikely that Hamas are going to give up their bloody ambitions anytime soon. You would hope, wouldn't you, given the near 30,000 people that have now been killed in Gaza, that Israel had dealt a death blow to Hamas's abilities to undertake further terror attacks, but I don't think there are any guarantees in place. And you have now the, uh, I, I don't even want to say clever, but I think rather cynical move by Israel to suggest that if they carry on killing in Rafa, if they move into the only tiny corner of that benighted part of the planet where one and a half million people are currently sheltering almost on top of each other, if they move in there and continue the killing, it will all be Hamas's fault for not giving up the hostages, which, I I mean, is diplomatically adroit, I suppose. But of course... How many of the one and a half million Palestinians sheltering on top of each other in Gaza have any influence or sway whatsoever over Hamas, who have not historically demonstrated much more concern for the lives of Palestinian civilians than the Israeli Defence Force has done? So once again, it's as if the people whose lives are on the line are the people whose voices are being completely ignored. In the case of the Israeli War Cabinet member Benny Gantz, I would say completely ignored very, very deliberately. The 10th of March is now the date written in the sand upon which those one and a half million Palestinians um, will face another offensive, another attack on, on the ground. It's already coming, of course, from the sky. So I don't make any apology for turning your attention to domestic politics. I think it is becoming important. It is currently unclear how Labour MPs will vote in a amendment brought by uh, the Scottish National Party calling for a ceasefire motion. It's not an amendment, I beg your pardon, it's a motion calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The vote is expected on Wednesday. The last time something similar was put before the House was back in November, when eight shadow ministers broke ranks with the leadership to back an immediate ceasefire, and another 56 Labour members defied a three-line whip. Um, That was the last time it happened. This time, 
it is up in the air. David Lammy, the Foreign Secretary, declined yesterday to say how Labour MPs might vote. Um, he talked of the need to scrutinise the motion and take it from there, which seems to me to be pertinent. Uh, he also added, and back in November I found this line very persuasive, he also added that the vote will not bring about a ceasefire. It's the diplomatic action that will do that. And, of course, as the opposition party in this country, um, despite the very, very long list of world leaders queuing up to meet Keir Starmer at a security summit in Munich this week, he is not the prime minister, brackets yet, close brackets. So, so a vote for an immediate ceasefire achieves nothing. in the context of the likelihood of Israel not going ahead with it. I think we can presume that Hamas are highly unlikely to release the hostages. We were told, I think, on, on occasions that they would have been completely eradicated by now or the hostages would have been freed or both. But here we are, facing the imminent attack upon the only part of the Gaza Strip that people who've been fleeing the attacks upon the Gaza Strip have been able to flee to. So... It seems to me that the world has changed. The picture has changed quite a lot since November. Uh, anybody who used the word proportionate or disproportionate when talking about the, and I again make no apology for the use of the word necessity here, the necessity of a, of a strong and immediate response to the atrocities of October the 7th. However, there, there was always going to come a point where the world would say too much, and they have public opinion is massively now stacked against Israel and, and uh, particularly against further attacks upon the population in Gaza. The, 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 the picture you get sometimes from British and American media is incredibly at odds with almost the rest of the world. It doesn't mean they're right and, and we, to use the word very loosely, are wrong, but it does mean that this idea of uh, support is simply not well, at the very least, it's not clear, and at the very most, it's not true. Those of us who worry about where Israel will be left after this worry even more about the question of where Israel will be left in the eyes of the world, particularly younger generations, uh, turning against Joe Biden, would you believe, in America, and favouring Donald Trump because of Joe Biden's uh, continuing support for what Israel does in the uh, in, in in the Gaza Strip, I, I just extraordinary that a six point lead for Trump among under thirty year olds in one poll that I've seen recently. But you know, I, I'm trying to make sense of that madness. Uh, left this building long ago, so that that I, I really want to stress that point because it, it's completely missed by the saber rattling or the or the pick a side and, and 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 slavishly defend its position that the the idea that you want the people of Palestine not to be killed and the people of Israel not to become international pariahs for generations to come seems to me to be the only humanitarian and decent position to adopt you you've got people in America and in the UK essentially calling for uh, ethnic cleansing, which is underway, and I, I think some people have come perilously close to calling for genocide. Members of Benjamin Netanyahu's cabinet, if not his war cabinet, have, have done so. They fit into that category. And where the hell would that leave Israel in the context of international reputation or, or, or simple m m morality? I don't know. I, I, the bit I've never quite got my head around. Thank you, by the way, for indulging me this morning it's important that we have these conversations the bit that i've never got my head around is the difficulty some people have in understanding why it is not only reasonable but i think absolutely essential to ask the israeli government to observe higher standards of conduct than than hamas so much of the commentary that i've seen latterly since christmas has sort of suggested that you, you, you can't expect Israel to be held to a higher standard than Hamas, which seems to me to be disgusting, to equate a sovereign government and, a, and, and an army with, um, I mean, at least a terrorist organisation prescribed pretty much as such by the entire world, or a death cult, if, if you prefer, that demonstrates precious or little concern for the lives 
of the people they claim to represent. That's, that's the bit I've never quite understood. I mean, the effort that goes into skewing media coverage in one way or the other is, is, is immense. But the idea that I, I would just expect Israel to be better than Hamas seems to me to have been lost from this conversation at the very earliest stages. So there's some backdrop. There's some background. Here is Keir Starmer going further than he's gone before. But, and this might well be the question that gets answered on Wednesday, has he gone far enough? What we all want to see, a return of all the hostages taken on October the 7th, an end to the killing of innocent Palestinians a huge scaling up of humanitarian relief and an end to the fighting. Not just for now. <laughs> an end to the fighting, not just now, not just for a pause, but permanently. A ceasefire that lasts conference that is what must happen now. The fighting must stop now. So I think, and now you know as much about what he said as I do, you don't need to hear any more. I think the politics of it is expressed thus. He is calling for a ceasefire in, in, and the release of the hostages. The question I think that Parliament will face on Wednesday is do we call for an immediate ceasefire from Israel while recognising that Hamas are not people that you can expect to behave either either humanely or, or even perhaps rationally. That, that seems to me to be the question. Calling for an immediate ceasefire and the release of the hostages will probably be in the detail of the motion. And therefore, the question for you today is quite simple. What should Keir Starmer do and why? Remember how this programme works, please. I know that um, it's, it's commonplace on these sort of subjects to hear an invitation to express your opinion without any expectation that you'd be asked to account for it. But, but, but that's not how we work together here. You have an opinion. I want you to explain it. and I want you to tell me why. So should Keir Starmer... It, 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 well, he's got several choices, hasn't he? But, but let's go for a three-line whip, a free vote, or a, or, or, or a three-line whip in favour, three-line whip against, or a free vote. My position, I, I think he's got to call for a ceasefire now. I think that the whole point of asking the question about when is, when is it too much, when is the line crossed, at what point do you recognise that Israel is embarked upon a mission to uh, eradicate Gaza in any recognisable sense while claiming the justification for, for doing so is the hostages whose families increasingly condemn Netanyahu for the tactics he's approached. And anybody paying attention recognises the, I think, the incongruity of claiming that you can eradicate Hamas and somehow get the hostages released. It, it has been from the start the elephant in the room, the fear that perhaps Benjamin Netanyahu, for either ideological or very personal reasons, is going to use this as an opportunity to inflict an apocalypse upon the people of Gaza, has now become irresistible. Um, uh, the Conservative Party doesn't know whether it's coming or going. He, he, too busy arguing about whether or not Kemi Badenoch is a liar or the man that she sacked from running the post office is a liar. Too busy running conflicting leadership campaigns for whoever is going to take over from Rishi Sunak if and when he loses the next election. Too busy coming up with meaningless policies about mobile phones in schools. David Cameron, and it pains me to say this, but you've got to be honest, is doing a decent job, but he seems to me to be operating almost as a satellite from government, almost as an independent entity out there in the world saying the right things to the right people at possibly the, even the right time. But the idea that the government as a whole a government that contains people like 30p Lee Anderson and Jonathan Gullis somehow stepping up to the plate and providing any form of international leadership is laughable. So here's the question. <clears throat> How can Keir Starmer possibly justify calling in a speech for a ceasefire but not voting for it on Wednesday? 03456060973 is the number that you need. I think the time has come. And you may be cross with me for not arriving at this point sooner. I think that they were right in November to uh, uh, remind us all that a vote in the British Parliament led by the British opposition would have precisely no impact upon the 
um, reality on the ground in Gaza, but I think the world has changed. I think the reality on the ground in Gaza has changed. I think sometimes leadership needs to be rhetorical, ideological, humanitarian, as much as it needs to be substantive. And the time has come for Keir Starmer to instruct his members to do what I think the massive majority of them would be minded to do independently, and that is vote for a ceasefire in Parliament on Wednesday. 03456060973. What do you want him to do and why? And this may come to be one of the big moments of his pre-prime ministerial career. Not, not over the line by any means, not counting any chickens, still perfectly possible that it could all go horribly wrong. But this looks to me to be a real moment. And, uh, and what he decides to do could prove crucial to his momentum and reputation if and when he arrives in Downing Street. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. Remember, it's, it's, it's a conversation about what... What you want to happen, and crucially, why? 03456060973 is the number you need. It's 1019. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 22 minutes after 10, and it is, I suppose, a question really about what, what, what things look like rather than what things are. So, so some quick clarifications. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu has given a televised press conference in which he made it clear that he will be sending troops into Rafa even if a hostage release was agreed, um, uh, something that seems to be missing from quite a lot of the coverage in some corners of the British media. So even if we achieve it, he told a televised news conference, we will enter Rafa. I think that adds to the pressure upon Keir Starmer to call for a ceasefire or to instruct his members to vote for a ceasefire on Wednesday. Um, It doesn't mean he was wrong not to do so in November, but it does mean that essentially Israel will be told by the loudest English-speaking voice yet that they are embarked upon an unjustifiable path. And it seems to me that that would be the act of a good friend and counsellor rather than um, an enemy or a, or a, a I, I don't know quite what the word would be, an apologist for terror. I don't know what phrase they'll use, but, but there it is. Um, he's going to do it anyway. One and a half million civilians sheltering in Rafa. Who will speak for them, if not Keir Starmer? Balama is in Lambeth. Balama, what would you like to say? Well, thank you, James. Uh, James, I just uh, wanted to start by saying that it is a straightforward question. Uh, Kirstama has no option on Wednesday but to vote for this uh, motion and to call on all Labour MPs to do the same. Because this is a straightforward question of right and wrong. And Kirstama uh, claims to respect international human rights law and humanitarian law. The International Court of Justice has said clearly that this is a plausible case of genocide uh, unfolding in Israel, uh, in, in Gaza. And I just don't see how... So I, just need, can, I, I know you're, you're, you're a bit more qualified, well, a lot more qualified in this field than I am, but it needs a little bit more nuance, that International Court of Justice finding. The, 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 the decision on whether or not genocide is, 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 is underway or has been committed will be taken years hence. So all that the court decided was that there was sufficient evidence to continue with the inquiry. That's where the word plausible comes in. There was sufficient reason to continue the contemplation, the court's contemplation of the possibility that genocide had been committed. I think when we say plausible genocide, it conveys a slightly different meaning to people listening than, than perhaps the court intended. I hope that doesn't sound like splitting hairs, but, I, but I, I personally think it's an important distinction to make. Yeah, it does in terms, uh, but what the International Court said uh, is that there is reason to continue to yes. inquire into whether genocide yes, has and, 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 and if you were... If you were four square behind Israel at the moment, you should and presumably would be deeply troubled by the fact that the accusation wasn't thrown out at the first hurdle. Yeah, but also, James, look at other facts. For example, uh, some members, uh, some workers of the uh, of the United Nations uh, Organization uh, for Refugee, uh, uh, Palestinian refugees, some of them were accused without any evidence of collaborating in the sub- ninth, uh, on the 7th October attack 
And what we saw was a complete withdrawal of UK money, US money from the organization, even though we haven't seen the evidence. And uh, so if, if, if you saw this, and this allegation was made by Israel, but the UK, the US, and other countries took this, this decisive measure, but then the International Court of Justice is saying there is a plausible case for us to well, they happened in a, They happened in the same weekend, didn't they? And uh, the, 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 the dossier that Israel supplied, I think, to an American newspaper, um, uh, it does, as you say, doesn't appear to have been um, subsequently backed up with oodles of evidence or, or substantive content. But by then, of course, the decision had been taken. And indeed, UNRWA... As you know, sacked some of the people that had been named, despite the absence of evidence that you describe. I've been on a bit of a crash course, so I hope I don't sound pedantic. That part of the problem is that the United Nations doesn't um, uh, currently have uh, Hamas on its list. The UN Security Council's list of terrorist groups doesn't have Hamas on it. So the UN doesn't screen for membership in Hamas during its hiring process, which adds even more nuance to what you're saying. So setting those things aside, if we can, and you may tell me that we can't and we shouldn't, what's, what, what, why do you see Keir Starmer's position as being absolutely on rails? There's absolutely no circumstances in which he could not vote for a ceasefire on Wednesday? Because, number one, uh, he has been clear uh, yesterday uh, calling on uh, for ceasefire uh, in his, uh, uh, in his yes. speech. But also because, like I said, uh, we are talking about over 11,000 children that are dead. The, this, the stats now show that over 70% of those who were killed in Gaza since 7th October are either women or children. And, uh, of course, uh, look at the context again, uh, James. The Israeli government now, one of the members of the war cabinet, is threatening that they are going to embed Rapa in Ramadan. And we need to understand the context of that. Ramadan is as important to the Muslims as Passover is important to the, to, to the Jews. It is as important to the Muslims as Christmas is important to the Christians. And not what, today, what Israel is threatening is that it is going to destroy Ramadan, is going to cancel Ramadan in, in Palestine, and it is going to stop Muslims from worshipping and praying and fasting. Just, just well, listen, imagine I, I, someone I, I, threatening again, no, to again, Christmas. Again, again, and I'm only trying to ensure that the conversation is... is, is, is completely open but again I, I and i have to choose my words very carefully here i don't think that the celebrations of ramadan in gaza at the moment are are, are likely to be even noticeable are they certainly I, I mean this is a brutal position that you put me in balama but it, you, they're already starving i don't know that fasting is going to be a a relevant issue in the in the context of march the 10th but i think the symbolism rather than the practice is is probably the more powerful point isn't it? it so you could say it would be like attacking christians at christmas or attacking jews at passover i i don't know that the the curtailment or the dilution of of the celebration of ramadan or the commemoration of ramadan is 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 likely to be relevant because of the circumstances in which these people are currently living do you understand what i yeah, mean yeah 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 but uh, yeah i mean you are making a very important point james but yeah. what israel is saying is that we will make it even nastier yes, even more yes. horrible even uh, um, uh, more dire uh, during ramadan and uh, i am just saying that this is a clear targeting of the particular festivity or yes, month yes, of Ramadan, yes. which is the most important for Muslims. But there are two men, uh, two other points, James. The, the third one is uh, to those who are saying uh, this uh, motion cannot change anything on the ground. James, we can say that for every other statement Kir Starmer made on international issue, his condemnation of the killing of Alexei Navalny is not going to bring back Alexei Navalny and is not going to change uh, Russia's uh, attitude. I think His condemnation really of the invasion of uh, of of of, uh, of, uh, of Ukraine is not going to change. Uh, I mean, Putin's anything policy. there? Yeah, yeah. And his condemnation of the, uh, for example, persecution of Uyghur Muslims is not going to change anything. We can as well say the UK government should stop condemning anything in international issues because it's not going to change anything. Uh, that's a very good point as well. I, I mean, does that mean that you think he was wrong in November as well as... He was, he, he, he was completely wrong in November, James, because if he had done that, 
that would have put pressure on uh, on Rishi Sunak to also take a position on this situation. And if uh, if the UK had called for ceasefire, that could have uh, uh, possibly swayed the U- US and other Western partners. And if that had happened, maybe they would have stopped uh, supplying arms and weapons to Israel, and maybe those, these killings would have been met, mitigated. Finally, James, on the question of hostage, yes. let's remember that uh, Netanyahu's position has always been, remember that a day before the um, previous hostage uh, exchange, he kept saying, as soon as you give us the hostage, we are going to attack you. And that's because Netanyahu doesn't want any hostage, hostages exchange. He wants to continue this war, and he's the only person that I know who continues to threaten the other party on the verge of signing an agreement. That was what happened in the last uh, hostage negotiations, and he is doing that now so that hostages will not be exchanged and so that people will continue to be killed. A few days ago, he said, if you give us the hostage, we will still continue the attack. And what you are telling Hamas is that we are attacking you with the hostages uh, with, uh, in your hands. We are trying to be careful not to kill the hostages. But even if you give them to us, we will continue to attack you. And that means the attack would continue, would, be, would even be more indiscriminate because the hostages are no longer with Hamas. What he is saying, Hamas indirect, telling Hamas indirectly is that continue to hold the hostages so that I have reasons to continue to attack you. I hear you. Thank you, Blum. I always, I always enjoy listening to you. And, and, and I suppose the only space you leave is for people to explain why Keir Starmer shouldn't support um, calls for a ceasefire on Wednesday, which uh, I presume would be this texter who's just called you offensive. This guy is offensive. Um, could ring in and tell us why Keir Starmer shouldn't do it, especially given this uh, comment from... Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the, the, the hostage release, e- e- even if it were to happen. I, I'm, I, I'm reading this from the Al Arabiya website and uh, referring to a television news conference that he gave earlier this week, um, uh, or rather late last week, in which he made it clear it wouldn't make any difference at all. And I, I, I mean, that it, we know that, though, don't we? Because if you release the hostages tomorrow, he'd say, well, we haven't eradicated Hamas yet. And that's always been the pincer movement of the Israeli position in that there's absolutely nothing the Palestinian people could do, even if they rose up. Well, they can't do that, I suppose. That, that, that'll be the next argument. In fact, that's close to where we are. If you don't rise up as an unarmed civilian population and overthrow these people that we're constantly told are armed to the hilt with weapons coming in through these tunnels, if you, with your, with your, with your pebbles, don't overthrow these armed terrorists, then um, it'll be your fault if you get killed. That, that is what it looks like to me. Right, tell me I'm wrong. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need. And uh, of course all of it's leading into, feeding into the question of what should Keir Starmer do on Wednesday. And I would like to hear an a, 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 an account of why he shouldn't back a ceasefire or, or back the motion calling for a ceasefire that is as articulate and as informed as Balama's. Um, I really would, and you know what to do if you think you can provide it. Thomas Watts has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.38 is the time, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Okay, listen, I only really stake my professional reputation on Brexit-related predictions. I I get other stuff wrong. I don't think I've ever got anything wrong about Brexit. But um, it seems to me as if the... uh, the, the numbers are moving. It seems to me as if Labour is looking quite likely to back the SNP motion on Wednesday calling for a ceasefire, not just because of, of Keir Starmer's words that you heard uh, a moment ago, but also because of the interviews where Streeting has been given this morning. Here's an example. We want to see a ceasefire, of course we do. Uh, and we've been increasingly concerned, as the wider international community has been, with the disproportionate loss of civilian life in Gaza. Of course Israel has a responsibility to get its hostages back. Every country in the world has a right to defend itself, but I think what we've seen uh, are actions that go beyond reasonable self-defence and also call into question whether uh, Israel has broken international law and the ICJ are now investigating, and we take all of that seriously. What Keir has sought to do throughout the conflict is to work in lockstep with our allies and uh, friends in the region, countries like Jordan, 
Uh, Egypt, Qatar have huge agency in this conflict and have been doing an awful lot of diplomatic heavy lifting behind the scenes, as has the United States. And we've sought to conduct ourselves in the way that we would if we were in government. Uh, lots of people are engaging with Labour on the basis that we could be the government late, later this year, including um, the, the world leaders that Keir met over the weekend in Munich at the Has Israel gone conference. too far? Well, I, I think objectively, yes. Uh, Israel has gone too far, and we see that with the disproportionate loss of innocent civilian life. And, and in this modern age, we see the unfiltered consequences of that on our social media feeds. And who could not be moved by the images of children killed or maimed or injured, as well as other civilians. And so I hope that what we've seen um, overnight, I, I gather um, we've got potentially another turning point in this conflict of the risk of escalation of, of the conflict into, into Rafa on the border with Egypt. We think that would be intolerable, unacceptable. We can't have Palestinians pushed into the desert, something that Egypt is now preparing for. What Israel has said is that they won't, they won't go into Rafa until I think the 10th of March, uh, and they're giving Hamas that window of opportunity to release the hostages, which they should, and maybe, just maybe, that opens the door to a diplomatic end to this conflict. Uh, at 10.41, I, I mean, objectively, yes. Has Israel gone too far? Objectively, yes. I, I don't know in all conscience how anyone can argue with that, but you are welcome to try. I, it means really you're arguing that Israel hasn't gone far enough, which is the rationale for attacking Rafa. And I have to tell you that, that it is perilously difficult to find people prepared to, to punt that position whereas when you remember at the in the immediate aftermath of the terrorist atrocity on October the 7th uh, the opposite was true it, it was very hard to find anybody to argue that Israel shouldn't go in with all guns blazing both metaphorically and of course a a actually so so there has been a shift I'm going to read you two texts before I go back to the phones because they're both rather brilliant um, albeit coming from slightly different, well, very different perspectives. They need, they're not polarised against each other, but Lisa first and then Bella. So Lisa writes, Starmer can do what he likes. It won't have any effect on what happens in Gaza, but it will give the right-wing press here an inch on anti-Semitism, and they, of course, will take a mile. Um, we know how that went in 2019. I, I mean, I, as you probably know, Lisa, I don't buy that parallel, but I do fully accept the um, corruption of the right wing media when it comes to uh, any attempt to malign a Labour leader for any reason. I just think the last one deserved it and this one doesn't. So far as the vile Netanyahu is concerned or Israelis worried about future attacks from Ham Hamas, what should be done? about the known routes for weapons um, supplies and the tunnels under Rafa. It's a dilemma never answered by those suggesting Israel should unilaterally lay down its arms and enter peace talks. Um, I, I, except it is, Lisa, as Bella points out, as an Israeli and a British resident, a three-line whip calling for a ceasefire is the only moral stance and one that supports Israel in the most meaningful sense. I, this comes closest to expressing my feelings, but of course I'm, 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 not, I'm neither an Israeli nor a Jew. Israelis are held hostage by Netanyahu and his alt-right government, and in taking a stance against their bloodthirsty selfishness, Starmer can also position himself as a sensible anti-extremist leader and signal his support for the Israeli Labour Party, which will hopefully be led by Yair Golan into the next election. He is a committed supporter of the two-state solution. And, and the, the, the reason I, object, I reject what you said, Lisa, is simply because you can't say I'm going to kill more children because Hamas has tunnels. It just doesn't, it just morally doesn't work. I'm gonna, keep, I'm gonna kill another 10,000 children because Hamas may still have some tunnels and we can't prove whether they have or they haven't because they won't let journalists into the Gaza Strip. It's, it's just becoming, it becomes indefensible, which is why for me, Starmer has to go with the vote on Wednesday. Hafsa is in Dubai. Hafsa, what do you think? Hi, good morning, Hello. James. Um, thank you for that. And. Um, just to sort of build, I guess, on West Streeting's comments and, you know, what we know from uh, Netanyahu and his uh, press statement on Saturday is, um, you know, now knowing that the invasion in Tarafa has uh, or is not um, influenced by the question of hostage release, I'm surprised that this is still even a debate mm. in terms of having a ceasefire. MPs are sent to Parliament to represent their constituencies. Overwhelmingly, there is support and has been for a long time for a ceasefire. The Labour Party should be responsive to their own constituents and to the people within their, um, within their party. The majority want it. 
And the fact that we have a leader of the, the political leader of the opposition who is an avowed human rights lawyer, supporter of the rule of law, there are egregious, insurmountable amounts of evidence on the question of the breach of international human, humanitarian law. And we're still having this debate over a ceasefire. And the second point I just want to quickly make is, on the flip side of that, what does not calling for a ceasefire serve? Who does it serve? Yeah. Does it serve British security interests in the region to have 1.5 million Palestinians flooding into Egypt? Does it serve Jordan's security interests with the increased rhetoric, the banning of worshippers or the limit of worshippers during Ramadan at the Al-Aqsa Mosque? Mm. Who is it serving in terms of British values, our security objectives, our partnerships and our relationships in the region, not to call for a ceasefire? And I don't understand if this man is going to be our leader how we can trust that in terms of political, uh, re- international uh, relationships and security, that this is still a debate when it's very clear what this means for the region if this goes ahead in two weeks' time. Well, I, I, OK. I, I mean, I'm, I'm late for the break. I'm perennially late for the break. I, I suppose part of the answer from Starmer's calculations, and you might find this unbearably cynical, is he has dedicated himself so far to taking weapons out of the hands of his enemies and and this, uh, calling for a ceasefire becomes a weapon in the in the media landscape of this country i mean the figure of how many people are supportive of further attacks by israel in terms of the the latest you've gov, gov polling is is staggeringly low but i i you know the the the, the perception that he is less than robust in his support for Israel's right to defend itself is what would be at stake on Wednesday. Which makes it significant, doesn't it, that Streeting has said objectively Israel has gone too far. So I think I just shot my own fox on that one. Well, we also have a court case in the High Court about whether Britain, uh, whether the government is breaking its own laws in terms of the parts it sends to the F-35 that um, go to this war and the question of the human rights uh, abuses. I, I didn't know that. that. I knew, I knew that the, it, I know that similar cases before the Italian and I think the Dutch courts have, have seen those countries stop sending parts. I didn't know there was one happening here. I, I, I need to read up on that. But I, I tell you if, you, if you're wondering about the tone of this conversation, then the, the figure of the British population, the percentage of the British population who think Israel should continue to take military action. I, I mean, it was incredibly low even in November when YouGov last did comprehensive polling. But you will not believe, given the nature of this conversation, this is why Hafsa says I can't believe this debate is still taking place. I tell you the percentage of the British population that thinks Israel should continue to take military action in Gaza. And I'll tell you after the break, because because I want you to actually spend a couple of minutes thinking about it. Realistically, if I say to you, I can't believe how low it is, how low do you think it goes? Um, and then we'll continue the question, really, of, of how Starmer can countenance any other decision on Wednesday, but to reflect the will to coin that horrible, horrible, corrupted phrase of the last few years, the will of the British people. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.52 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, and, uh, you know, when I say to you that one of my major concerns, this upsets almost everybody, which it shouldn't really, but when I say to you that one of my major concerns is, is where this leaves Israel when, when the fighting, as it must, stops, that the death toll in Gaza is, is going to be the epitaph for this whole saga. It, it, it won't be the number of hostages who were released. Um, most people probably couldn't give you the, the current number of, of people who have been released versus the number of people who still haven't, and partly because it's impossible to know who's still alive and who's dead, in many cases, quite possibly dead at the, at the end of Israeli munitions designed to attack the people who are holding them and all of the people who are completely innocent. The numbers are just obscene, obscene now. So if you are motivated by a fear of, of what Israel is do, what Benjamin Netanyahu is doing to Israel's international reputation, then this statistic here should pose two enormous questions. Uh, why is the landscape, the media and political landscape in this country so apparently divorced from this simple statistic? And look, no polling is perfect, but goodness me, it's pretty comprehensive and, and we rely on it in all sorts of circumstances. And question number two, what, why do people who are hemorrhaging support um, in, in the British 
on the American side of things, continue to support the the cause that is hemorrhaging support. So it's up five. The 66% who say that Israel should be prepared to enter into peace negotiations with Hamas, you might accuse them of naivety, and you might be right. But here's the figure. What percentage of the British people do you think... Uh, I believe Israel should continue to take military action. And the figure is 13, 1-3%. So Chris in Nottingham, I think, aimed low. And he wrote this, 15%, James. I can only imagine that it's the rump of voters who've co-opted Israel's cause to validate their own Islamophobia. They must be the only ones left. I think you're probably right, but it's not even 15%. It's 13%. 13 percent people who think israel's attack on gaza is justified as in retrospectively not not in terms of what happens next that's down to 24 it was 29 in november so when wes streeting says objectively israel has now gone too far he speaks for the british public almost all of it certainly when he says there needs to be a ceasefire now when keir starmer says there needs to be a ceasefire now they speak for all but 13 percent of the population and and the second question that poses is well why doesn't this matter more oh three four five six oh six i haven't really got time but why doesn't that matter more why is this polling not more pertinent to the political positioning of both major parties in this country 13 percent of the population think israel should continue to take military action to open a british newspaper or to watch parliament you'd think that it was the other way around wouldn't you wouldn't you You'd think it was the other way around. I don't understand that. I, I genuinely don't. I've got no subtext, no nuance. I just don't get it. Any other circumstances where an action is supported by just 13% of the British population, even Brexit got 52. I, I, what, how, can you make sense of that? Because I can't. Annie's in Carnforth. Annie, what would you like to say? Oh, hello, James. Hello. Well, I'd just like to comment on, on what you just said about um, what this is doing to Israel's international reputation. I'd also like to say, what is this doing to our international representation? Yes. And by that, I mean Western countries, I mean Britain, America, Germany, the countries who are still sending arms to Israel, who have withdrawn aid through UNRWA uh, when there is a famine going on. You know, the 600,000 people in the north of Gaza now who are literally starving to death, which is a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but they are eating grass and animal feed and drinking seawater. So we could be seen if this eventually does uh, be seen by the um, ICJ as a genocide. We could be seen as complicit so that, that's just a comment I wanted to make on that. Yeah, on what uh, well, you I don't, I, I mean, you know, I've been challenging everything everybody says this morning, but I don't think I can challenge any of that because you've couched it very intelligently in, in, in ifs and therefores, haven't you? If, if the ICJ finds genocide has been committed, then countries that were still sending arms to Israel as it unfolded will, will, will be on the hook, won't they? They will be complicit in the, in the eyes of the International Court of Justice, but you know how it works. So they'll, they'll start denigrating that. they denigrate the International Monetary Front. I'm surprised the World Health Organization hasn't come in for a kicking today because they reported yesterday that the only hospital in southern Gaza had been, in Rafah, had been rendered inoperable by Israeli bombardments. It's it's extraordinary really. And then, and then you turn to this 13% number and you wonder quite what planet is being inhabited by much of the commentary and, and, and politicians. But on we go, on we go, Annie. Yes, I wanted to say as far as, um, you know, the vote, I mm. do think that Keir Starmer sh um, should um, whip his all his MPs to vote for, a, you know, an immediate ceasefire um, because he is probably going to be our next PM and he, he needs to show that he, A, he has a moral compass and B, and very importantly, I think, which, you know, is related to what I just said earlier, that he does have a respect for international law, which I think is not being respected by the countries who really are not taking any notice of the, I don't know whether they were recommendations, uh, the things that the, uh, the ICJ actually said that Israel had to do, like mm. making sure that aid was getting through. And we know it killing. hasn't been. We know that there have been, you know, blockades at, the, at, yeah. the, at one of the gates to, to prevent aid from getting through. And, and, of course, Israel should be doing everything it can to 
prevent that from happening? Well, of course, it could prevent that. A couple. So we're, of we're in a weird, of... we're in a weird kind of vortex, aren't we? Because I, I have incredibly informed listeners. This has been demonstrated once again today, and the quality of texts and tweets coming in equally so. And and it reflects so you know reflects that thirteen percent figure. You think this idea that. British newspapers, much of the British media is united in the belief that Israel is continue, justified in continuing its attack on Gaza, even as 13% of the British population agrees. that The conversation seems to be unfolding in, in, in parallel, doesn't it, a lot of the time? Is that, you've just reminded us of some of the other things that came out of the International Court of Justice that essentially put Israel on notice, didn't it, you could say, whether you were a, 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 a friendly critic or, or a sworn enemy. It put Israel on notice in order to avoid the possibility that this genocide will move from plausible to actual. You must be doing these things and then measurably and observably they haven't done some of them. I don't think they've done any of them, have they? I don't. I don't. I, mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm just thinking of the aid barricades that that we've um, that have been reported, and that that's largely because they're on the Israeli side of the fence. If they were on the other side, it'd be precious impossible to get to get cameras in there. Annie, thank you. I, well, listen, it's just one radio show, just one hour of one radio show. But if you knit together the contributions we've heard today and the speech that Keir Starmer gave yesterday and the interviews that Wes Streeting has given this morning and balance it against what David Lammy said yesterday about the irrelevance, for want of a better word, of a parliamentary vote in the context of the broader picture, I, I think Lammy's voice is being drowned out. I think that it is looking almost impossible for Labour not to actually follow up the rhetoric with votes if and when this motion is put before the House on Wednesday. And, of course, it's a motion brought by the SNP, so um, I, we should recognise that and recognise Stephen Flynn. Up next, phones in schools. James O'Brien on LBC. Four minutes after 11 is the time. Um, I, I, I told you, didn't I, there was another drama on the way that looked set to follow where Mr Bates versus the post office had led, and it starts tonight on... ITV. Um, it is brought to you by Jed Mercurio, who is you know just a genius, isn't it, when it comes to matters television. Uh, and uh, Rachel Clark, a friend of the great friend of the program, and one of my full disclosure guests during lockdown, has written it. She'll be joining us at about eleven forty-five today to talk us through this extraordinary dramatization of the early days of the pandemic. You may have heard it with Carol Vorderman yesterday, but. Um, Sometimes things are so important that I take the view that it's worth hitting you over the head with them until you actually start paying attention. So make sure that you catch that. Tonight's opener is a, a, an absolute stormer. Um, have you ever wondered, I know, well, I know you have, whether or not they just sit around desperately trying to find things to announce. The thing about Rishi Sunak's five pledges is that they are... Not going very well. The boats haven't been stopped. The economy is in recession. Inflation has come down because of the Bank of England policy over which Rishi Sunak has no influence or say whatsoever. Hospital waiting lists are up, as far as I can tell. And what was the um, what was the last one? What was the fig on? A special prize. I'm not going to look them up. We've got to do it from memory because this is quite interesting. We are what you might call... Uh, informed people, engaged with current affairs, right? So what's the fifth one? Has anyone got it? So the boats haven't stopped, right? The economy hasn't grown, right? The waiting lists haven't come down, right? I'm going to do that annoying right, aren't I, every time now. Infl inflation has come down, but it's got absolutely nothing to do with government policy. What's the fifth pledge? Let me check my text, see if you're paying attention. What is the fifth pledge? What, seven bins? What's the fifth pledge? Get rid of the seven bins? That wasn't a pledge, was it? Get rid of the non-existent bins? Abolish the non-existent meat tax? What was this? What was the fifth pledge? Come on, I'm not doing this for my own... Oh, yeah, I've done, yeah, I've done waiting lists. So it's, it's inflation, economy, boats, waiting lists. What's the fifth one? You're not allowed to look it up. I'll be able to tell as well. I'll be able to... I can read you my... What's the fifth one? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, the weirdest thing about this government, it's sort of dog days of this multiple 
leader regime. I was writing about it yesterday. So I'm, I'm writing a new chapter or I'm writing a couple of thousand words actually for the paperback version of How They Broke Britain, which remarkably was still in the Sunday Times top 10 yesterday. So thank you to everybody who's bought that. It's been an absolute joy to see that book fly um, into your lives. Was it the national debt? Was it reduced the national debt? There we go. That's from Robert in Oxford. Well done. Debt. You, there's no. Ne- so Robert just right, rightly, nicely writes, reduce the national debt. Someone wrote, it's debt, you plumb. Why do you have to bring plums into it? That's just so unnecessary. Reduce the. How's that going? How's the reducing the national debt go? I should know this, really, shouldn't I? But here's the point, right? In the absence of success, it sounded a bit like that George Michael song, in the absence of security, in the absence of success. What will fill the space? And that is the question to which I will turn your attention next. Because I found something almost unbearable about interviews that Esther Jai gave last week, that the, the mother of Brianna Jai, the murdered teenager, um, calling for special phones to be made for under-16s to stop them accessing social media. And the reason why I found it almost unbearable, and the reason, in fact, why I waited a few days before telling you was that it sounds to me it seems to me like calls for the genie to be put back in the bottle i i don't know maybe it's plausible for 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 coming generations for the 10 year olds and the 11 year olds currently dreaming of getting their first smartphone for christmas or for their birthday maybe you could just tell them sorry it's not going to happen until you're 16 but i don't i mean i just don't believe it personally to be plausible i just don't i'd love to be wrong but i just think that that is a genie back in bottle mission that 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 the country is neither equipped to deliver nor perhaps even capable of trying so you look next at what the government may do and this government i i really am now reaching the point where i struggle to find the words to describe their awfulness you know, the, the uh, failure to do anything about the post office scandal after that panorama in 2015. That's when John Sweeney and Nick Wallace made a panorama program with a Fujitsu whistleblower. The doors were blown off that post office scandal in 2015, long after, incidentally, Sir Ed Davey had been the minister with responsibility for post offices. So I can't even count how many Tory ministers have had responsibility for post offices since the doors were blown off the scandal in 2015. Nine years ago, nine years ago, give or take a few months. And they suddenly make some announcements after a television programme about the importance of doing things. Big story around this weekend, by the way, about uh, the bloke who Kemi Badenoch sacked as head of the post office, claiming that he'd been told to delay compensation payments in order to sort of give the government an easy ride into the next election, keep the figures off the balance sheets. Um, And uh, she's accused him of lying which is, uh, it's an interesting gambit, isn't it, for a government minister to accuse someone they sacked of lying on social media. I'm sure she'll be exposing herself to robust questioning by uh, non-client journalists at the first opportunity. If, if, if anyone sees her today, do remind her of the phone number, 03, by between 10 and 1, 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. So what do you do if your pledges are falling to pieces? And you need to give the population the impression that you are busy. Busy is a great word. We're very busy. What do they? What do you think they do all day? What do you think they do all day? Grant Shapps has come under fire today from military chiefs for being too obsessed with his own leadership campaign to actually do the job of Secretary of State for Defence. You'll remember last week he was writing about how the army was too woke. I think he may have even included the police in that list. And today we discover that... Uh, uh, the sexist trolling of female police officers is out of control. And yet, you you, you know, remember, it's anti-woke. You've got to get... We do not have training for police officers. Don't train them about decent behaviour, about toxic masculinity or diversity, even as they engage in racist and misogynistic trolling of their own colleagues. Absolutely clear that nobody needs a wake-up call on, on what to do. So Grant Shapps gets a kicking today from military chiefs. Oh, and the debt. I forgot about Laura Trott. So debt's not coming down either, is it? Because the Chief Secretary of the Treasury told us it was. And uh, Evan Davis on the PM programme on Radio 4 explained to her what numbers do and how percentages work. 
Sheesh. So debt's not coming down as a, as a percentage of GDP. So what do you do if you are a government and everything is falling apart and you are populated by political flotsam and jetsam, the talent puddle from which the Prime Minister is compelled to draw candidates is so, so, so shallow now that Nadine Dorries probably fancies her chances of a comeback. You've got people queuing up to compete for the title of most incompetent Conservative minister in history, and frankly, you can't put a cigarette paper between them. So where do we go? I know what we do. We announce a ban on mobile phones in schools, even at break times. Now, I am aware of schools where mobile phones are already banned in schools, even at break times. I'm aware of schools where phones are handed in in the morning and not given back until in the evening. Um, Ministers are now issuing guidance to ensure consistency across all schools. So it's not even a rule. Education Secretary Gillian Keegan, who you will remember, is the one who thinks that we should be giving her more praise and compliments. We should be telling her more often what a fantastic job she's doing. I am happy now to read out the list of Gillian Keegan's greatest achievements, as not just as Education Secretary, but also as a politician. <coughs> How long have I got before the emergency tape kicks in? Is, is there a, not much longer than that? Were you on your tenterhooks then? You, because you, normally you say in my ear, you go, speak! Like that, in, in quite a sort of, I, I find sometimes quite a, a rude tone, Keith. But anyway, that was that was the list of the things we can all agree that British politics has benefited from as a direct consequence of Gillian Keegan's decision to become a politician. And today, it is currently up to individual heads to decide policies on mobile phones and whether they should be banned. But today, every single newspaper is announcing new steps which are meaningless and not neither... St- statutory nor indeed enforceable to instruct head teachers on how to ban the use of phones not only during lessons but during break and lunch periods as well so i would like to talk about plausibility i'd like to talk about two things i'd like to talk about whether or not a ban on phones in schools means diddly squat to you as a teacher as a student or as a parent and, and by student, I guess I mean people who are either listening to this during break because they're sixth formers or people who recently left school. I am 52 years old. I've got teenage daughters, but I have absolutely no idea about what the relationship is between phones and schools. I don't even know what the rules are at their school. I know that I think the youngest, if I try and get hold of her during the day, I can't, which means that her phone is off. Whether or not that's through her personal choice or whether it's school policy, I do not know. I can only tell when she's finished school for the day because she pops back up on Find My iPhone. So I have absolutely no idea what the relate. but I bet you I know more than Gillian Keegan does. Uh, this, uh, it looks to me to be horrible, and that's why I said that it broke my heart to reflect upon the plausibility of what Brianna Jai was calling for. I think they have literally said, "How can we jump on? How can we jump on Esther Jai's publicity? How can we jump on those very poignant interviews that Esther Jai gave last week, calling for children under sixteen to be issued with what we used to call brick phones, with phones that can't access the internet? I think the Secretary of State for Education, as schools are crumbling, classrooms are uh, horribly oversubscribed, the teaching profession is in freefall. The Secretary for State for Education spent last week thinking, how can we get a bit of this sweet, sweet publicity? And they've come up with the idea to announce something that many head teachers already do, and the ones that don't won't be required to do under the things that she's announced quarter past 11 is the time extraordinary really and i think she isn't she the one whose husband was the chief executive officer of fujitsu i think it's just extraordinary when you scratch the surface of this government what you find wriggling underneath so teachers parents pupils what do you reckon Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. It looks to me like a load of old nonsense. So we'll look at the specifics of what they've called for today, what they've announced today. How can we look busy while well, we're not actually doing anything? Actually, Joe's put it better than I did. What can we do that makes it look like we're tackling a problem that's in the media spotlight without actually doing anything or spending any money? Answer, paging Gillian Keegan. I wonder if the pages are still allowed. But here's a question I really want you to think about beyond the details of, of today's specific announcement. Is it possible for our society to change the relationship of young people and smartphones? 
I, I kind of want it to be. I can think of few better memorials to Brianna Jai than for her mum to succeed on this mission. I am pessimistic, but I'm also idealistic. So I would love you to persuade me that it can actually be done. How feasible do you think it is? I don't know what they do in other countries. I, I can't imagine there is a country on the planet where children aged over 11 are not plugged into their smartphones, in some cases 24-7. I just can't see it. So we can talk about the politics of it, which is really an invitation to either agree or disagree with me that Gillian Keegan is wasting all of our time this morning, not least head teachers. 0345 6060 973. But the second question is a really important one, and I think we owe this to Esther Jai. We owe this to Brianna's mum, even if the conclusion we arrive at is not the one she will want to hear. Can you do this? Can you take phones? Can you take smartphones off teenagers? And do you want to? Because those two questions do not have the same answer. I don't particularly, but we're quite blessed, I suppose, in our house. Neither of my kids have been haunted by what goes on on their phones. I know, I know, friends of theirs and, and, and children of friends of mine who've had some terrible experiences. And that would mean you'd answer yes to the question of, would you want to take smartphones off children? But could you? I just, I, I just can't. But again, on this program, I don't just want the what of it, I want the why of it. So if I, if Gillian Keegan had announced today that it would suddenly become illegal for children under 16s to carry smartphones it would, as a policy, at least have the benefit of substance, importance, impact, power, change. Instead, she's essentially announced nothing but been rewarded with headlines by friendly newspaper editors. Also, it's Monday, and I'll tell you something about Monday's newspapers. The, the, the skeleton crew that isn't on a Sunday charged with filling a paper, they'll print almost anything. If you've got some old twaddle that you want to get out into the news media, phone up a newspaper on a Sunday. Seriously, they've got so many empty pages. It's, it's extraordinary. So it's very much what we'd call a Sunday for Monday story. But it doesn't change the fundamental question, and in many ways the Esther Jai angle on this, which I find close to heartbreaking, because I think the thing she's calling for is impossible. Do you? 0345 6060 973. I'd, I'd stress again, I want to be wrong. So, I, James, I work with children, I work in telecoms, I work in a school. It's perfectly reasonable to detach a 13-year-old, say, to detach a 14-year-old from their smartphone until they're 16. I just can't currently see it. Uh, hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973. It's 20 past 11. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 23 minutes after 11 is the time. It's, I mean... One of the, I was hoping for a bit more of a ding-dong in the last hour. I don't mean to make light of the seriousness of the subject matter, but you need to start helping me spar. You need to start getting me ready for the, for the future when we'll be holding the Labour government to account as opposed to the Tory government. But 14 years of holding this shower to account has almost broken me. And how bad does it have to get? Extraordinary. You remember, you remember seven bins in the meat tax? Well, today you've got Gillian Keegan telling head teachers who already ban mobile phones in schools to ban mobile phones in schools and telling the head teachers who don't already ban mobile phones in schools that they should really ban mobile phones in schools, but there's absolutely no compunction or instruction or um, uh, statutory requirement to do so. It's just daft. The bigger question is about Esther Jai and the idea that we can turn this tide back. I've also got a contender for Idiot's Corner who has opened their text by saying, please, James, why are you putting yourself in Idiot's Corner? So we could have a bit of a set two there in a moment. First, though, Ian's in Chester. Ian, what do you think? Oh, hi. Um, well, I might disappoint you because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to agree. I mean, I'm a teacher, <laughs> secondary school teacher. Um, long story short, we've had a policy for 10, 15 years with phones. Um, they're allowed to use it breaking dinner, um, but they're not allowed to use it in the classroom. Right. Um, and if we take, if we see it, we take it. If they refuse, we get a member of the senior team to take it off them, and it's gone for the day. Caught twice, and your parents have to come in to collect it. Um, and that's it. It's a simple rule, which, to be honest, it's not really a problem. The pupils are fine. Um, but I just wanted to make the point that we use 
a, a lot of mobile phones in lessons now. Um, so you say I you mean, are I'm, allowed to take your phone out now? Yeah, if, if, with the teacher's permission. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, you know, I'm a geography teacher. We do stop go um kind of motion pick films yeah. to make uh, waterfalls or to make longshore drift or whatever. Um, so the pupils make it and then they upload it onto Google Classroom where all their homework is set um, and where they get the results instantly once they've, they've done their homework. I forgot about, um, that. I forgot about that. So in uh, fact, you, with that, I mean, I know that they could have a laptop as well. Weren't they all supposed to get free laptops during COVID? Didn't, didn't yeah. Boris Johnson announce that? He, well, we had some funding, but it yeah. wasn't much. I mean, I our know. teacher team went out and um, asked the local businesses, and they were very, very good. Um, so we managed to get them, but it was off the back of the hard work of the senior leadership team, to be fair. Sounds, so, sounds uh, about right. So, so, you, yeah. so, so you can the, the head t- the head decides the policy. It's it's workable. How workable would it be not to have them during break and lunch? Um, well, my daughter's school. I mean, she's grown up now, but yeah. when she was at school, they used to warn them as they came in to and take it off them. Yeah. Um, but that caused problems. I mean, unfortunately, she was involved on a school bus in a fatality, so the police obviously stopped them, interviewed everyone. Right. But because she didn't have a phone, I said, don't, you know, don't take your phone. Yeah. I couldn't get hold of her, and there was no one at the school, and she was there for an hour and a half, middle oh. of winter. So, I mean, it's no one's fault. It was just one of those things. But um, after that moment, I said, look, get, you can have the phone in your bag, but if you get caught, I'm not going for a week. It'll, it'll stay in the school for a week, and I never have to go in. So, um, no, so, so, so... Actually, the system's working, as it is, um, probably. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what absolutely. about the other thing? I know you didn't ring in to answer this, but I think it's a really, I mean, it's a poignant question, not just an important one. How feasible do you think it is for under-16s, both those who've got smartphones or, if we were to be even more detail-driven, the, the ones who haven't yet but are hoping to. How feasible is it to turn back the tide and just tell them, "Sorry, you can't. You're going to have a. You're going to have like. You know, you'd be lucky if it's got a snake on it." For fans of the old Nokia, um, I, I think it would be exceptionally difficult. Yeah, I, I think it's just you know. I mean, if you think as an adult, how much we use a phone, how important it is to us, banking, communication, everything. Um, for pupils, they're kind of using it for the same reasons. Yeah, um, and, and you I'm, know, I was I, I just reminded me. I'm trying to get Richard, what's his um, I'm trying to get the the phone, the, the Oyster card put on the mobile phone. But that yeah. that would be another reason, wouldn't it? Why this would be a very bad idea? Because yeah. I know that under in London, under 16s have a separate card. They don't have it on their phone. But it's surely not that far off in the future when the app is on their phone that gets them to and from school on the bus. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and the, we we even have a system now. Parents can check on their attendance in lesson every lesson they know when they're getting homework they know all the and that's on an app as well so it, it's it, it's pretty intrinsically it's, uh, fundamental yeah. i mean it, it is that's why i use the phrase genie genie out the bottle territory but uh, i you know the last thing you want to do is tell esther jai that she's barking up the wrong tree or that she's she's aiming for tilting at windmills on this one but but she, well the ends in chester thank you mate sarah's in crawley sarah what would you like to say Oh, hi, James. I just wanted to say I agree with the school policy. Uh, My children are 10 and... No, you don't need to tell me. You don't need to tell me how old they are. If you you agree with the policy, I know that your children aren't 11 yet. Agree with it. Yeah, so your children aren't 11 yet. No. They haven't started secondary school. They haven't started secondary school. No, I I, I knew that from the minute you said that you agreed (laughs) with the policy. (laughs) <laughs> fine, fine. But tell me there why. Are arguments about it. Yes. Um, I agree because obviously it's distracting from the school day and we just have it at school. Year six is for safety for walking in. But I was ringing up regarding the more likely to stop children or go yes. backwards and not have smartphones. My children use it to communicate with their friends because they're not allowed out to play. Why not? And we don't let them... Because I don't... I don't... We, no one, none of, no one plays out. No one... Hmm. We do it. I can go out. Right. And I watch them. But of an yeah. evening, we come home and they go and they call their school friends all on FaceTime, go on Roblox. And they're so they've got and smartphones, even though they're not at secondary school yet? Yeah, 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 they've got right. smartphones, yeah. Well, even the seven-year-old? Uh, he, well, he can't really read or write. He just plays Roblox on it. It's yeah. like him and iPad, so isn't he's got, it? It's so he's just, got a smartphone? Yeah. Crikey. Yeah, they both do. But everyone does. I, I know it sounds mad. I don't know anyone whose children don't have have one. No, and that not I mean, a new one. So don't get me wrong; they're old phones. You know, they're not like. But they're still smartphones, and they're online. If he's playing, yeah, Roblox, they're online. He can get online. Yeah, they are. See, the, they're the, online. The, the 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 thing that 
the reason why I knew that your children weren't of secondary school age yet was <laughs> because, well, two things. Number one, you still think that you can control everything they do, don't you? Uh, I try. Yeah. No, tell, <laughs> answer the question, impossible. Sarah. You still believe um, that you can control everything they do online, don't you? Yes, yes, yeah. that's correct. And at what age do you think that will cease to be true? Probably when they get more sneaky and can get around my... Um, my own security. So probably like twelve, thirty. They're quite good at it now. My daughter, my ten-year-old. Yeah, I bet she she is. She knows more than me, and um, uh, yep. she can try. Yeah. Um. So we have to be really on it, and sometimes get over her shoulder and do spot checks. Um. I you like know, it. No, I mean, listen. I'm only. I'm. I'm. I'm fifty-two percent <laughs> teasing you, and forty-eight uh, percent <laughs> nodding along. The 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 problem will be that when they want to go to secondary school, what you've just said to me will still apply, like all the other children will have one. So even if you tried to bring in a rule that said you can't... So you're saying, I don't know, they're always going to have the phones, but they shouldn't be allowed to get them out at school. Yeah, because even when I was at school, it was just we were getting phones, not smartphones, but they were so distracted in lesson. I do agree, no phones in lessons, not even in the... But I, think everyone, I think everyone pretty much yeah. agrees with that. I don't... I, 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 this is Sarah, well done. I think it sounds like you're dealing with it. It's tough, isn't it, for... People of a certain age to hear Sarah, a committed mum, careful mum, um, conscientious mum, just very casually saying no one plays outside anymore. I, I'm, I know it's a little bit rose tinted and a little bit old git of me, but that is so sad, isn't it? No one plays outside anymore. No one plays outside anymore. And that is something else that Gillian Keegan seems to have missed. The thing about being this age, right? I don't know how old Gillian Keegan is, but I presume she's around my sort of vintage. I've told this is becoming a real mantra on the programme. It's bad enough when it's punters and commentators who suffer from it, but when it's actual politicians who are making ideas framed by their own experiences when they were 12 and not by what it's like to be 12 now, it's absolutely absurd and, and probably quite dangerous. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 25 minutes to 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where, I, I mean, what's, is there a word? Is there a German word for running out of, I don't want to say outrage. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not outraged by this. There's enough to be outraged about. The, 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 the sort of fatigue, just running out of, and it's not energy, because I have the enormous privilege of talking with you every day. I can never get tired of that. But another Tory comes along with another ludicrous announcement. What, what would you be? If you were in charge of schools at the moment, what would you be prioritising? Uh, it's racker, the concrete problems, or, or the energy bills? That, there's a good one. The, you know, I, I, I got a message from a governor of a school saying that he can't remember a single conversation about the problems posed by mobile phones in schools. However, we are beginning to uh, wonder how the hell we're going to pay our energy bills. So you've got the Secretary of State for Defence writing articles to the Daily Express about how the troops are too woke, even as our aircraft carriers fail to set sail for a NATO exercise just off the coast of Norway. And you've got the Secretary of State for Education telling head teachers to do either what they're already doing or which they aren't doing yet because they know they can't. Just madness. It's, what would you call it? It's not even government by numbers, because at least when you do painting by numbers, when you finish, it looks good, doesn't it? You know, I've never done painting by numbers because, well, I tried once and actually when I finished it didn't look good. I, I, right, I, I had to tell you something else as well. I need, I need some genuine advice. I forgot to tell my colleagues about this. So you know the clips, right? Actually, put, get, come off the phone, Eleanor. This is quite important. This is a bit of a conference. We should start doing our team meetings on air because then everyone can join in. You know the clips? All the clips, all the clips. Uh, you know how we invented viral clips, now everyone's at it, right? Yeah. And you know how I never, ever acknowledge the existence of the camera, right? I look at you. I look at you two, usually. I, I, I watched a couple over the weekend, just for research purposes. And I think it's beginning to look a bit weird. I think the, t I think the medium has changed. I think the viral clip has become so commonplace now. Everybody else, all the seagulls following our trawler. I think I might have to start, especially because the show's on YouTube as well. I think I might start acknowledging the existence of the camera a bit more. Uh, well, it looks like I'm looking up to you, but there's only two of you in the production team. There's potentially, you know, uh, if this was a Kemi Badenoch trade deal, 
then I would announce that everybody with internet access is potentially watching this program at the moment. If this was a Kemi Badenoch mini trade deal, then I would say now, how many people do we think have got internet access in the world? Can we, can we, can we actually get an answer to that question? How, how many people do we think have got internet access in the world? And then shortly I will announce the YouTube channel for this program in the style of a Kemi Badenoch so-called trade deal, all right? But in the meantime, what do people think? about because i've just realized you're the last people on earth i should be asking because i will no longer be making eye contact with you right or you i will instead be making eye contact with you the mo most important member of the team you yeah the most important member of the team is you so i'm thinking i'm, I'm and there's a little red light there as well which actually now i've come to notice it it kind of draws the so i think but i can't do the whole show like this can i or do you think i should do the whole show of putting to who is it? Oh, it's off-putting on the screen because I'm looking at what, like Doctor Who villain off-putting, or mildly, or just not used to it yet. Oh, so what? The occasional acknowledgement like this. So I go off on a, and a thing about Julia Keegan. Did you know that her her husband actually he runs Fujitsu like that, and then back to nuts. So just do that. It's a bit like being in front of a of an audience, isn't it? You don't do it all to one person sitting in row D. You could kind of go over like, anyway. It's like, yeah, yeah, I like doing stand-up, except not funny in my case. But there, there's the, anyway, there's your question for the today. Rachel Clark with us shortly, and don't forget my new feature, my favourite story of the day. Do -do 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 on the way. Back to the fun. Poor old Nina in Harpenden. And you weren't expecting to have that bilge inflicted upon you when you rang in today. I bet you've got better <laughs> things to do. What would you like to say, Nina? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so I, I work in a busy secondary school, and I'm a support staff. Um, Can't be that busy so, if you're ringing me. <laughs> well, I, well, I am on half term. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. I, I believe that's so, what they call an own. Uh, well, I'm on half term. Carry on. Um, so, the, the, I think she's repeating already what schools are already doing. Yes. You know, it's in our, our school behaviour policy states that you know you turn your phone off when you come into school, and you don't put it on again until you leave. Unless it's unless it's required for a lesson, which isn't very often. And where do they um, keep them physically? Um, they keep them in their bags. They won't put them in lockers because of the fear of um, you know could get locker could get broken into, right. taken away. So they can keep them in their bags. And hand we on heart, them. I mean, yeah. there's no way, is there, that they don't at least occasionally? Of course yeah, they do. Yeah. And when they're caught, yeah. that phone is confiscated. And brought down to me, and um, and you're the phone you know, keeper. I'm the phone keeper. Well, part of that you is should my have that in your job title. <laughs> but well, yeah, phone they keeper. Should you should really. have your own jingle. Yeah. Really, I wear many hats. I'll, I'll tell you, I wear many hats. Like Mr. But, ben. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but the, what we're not considering here, yeah, she, she's saying the same thing. I mean, schools are already doing this. And I find it really offending yes. that they're just telling us what to do when we're already doing it. There's no, what she's not even, I've not even heard her mention about um, the the element of safeguarding here. No. You know, because, you know. She doesn't you know, care, mate. She doesn't care, Nina. No. Sorry, she so doesn't care, phone keeper. No, 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 no. There's a safeguarding element here. Release so what, the phone She's keeper. not mentioned about county lines. Oh, God, or of course. Or upskirting, yeah, no, videoing can't. other children, yeah. you know, in schools. These are really, really serious safeguarding issues. Um, elements that we need to consider. These are the reasons why we should be um, not just banning phones from school, but but giving them, switch them off. Most of the children will do as they're told, but then there's the few that don't. Um, so, and then I've even had um, phones taken off a student, and they've got another phone. Well, that's that's we're thinking. Then we ask questions. Yes. Why has that child got another? Phone? Sounds like Gillian Keegan's. She's just adding to your burdens, really. She's sort of get yet more. What she's saying here is, why aren't you doing more? When frankly, every teacher or every school worker I've spoken to is already doing more than is humanly possible. Oh my God! If if she, it's another. It's another. Um, uh, it's, it's just another politician, a Tory politician, any politician that has got no grip on the real life. Of oh, real well, you life. don't say and that. At least they abolished the meat tax. <laughs> and how many bins have you got? Oh, oh, I'm, that's not my department. 
Well, I mean at home. <laughs> at home? Yeah, you can't be the I've bin got, keeper and oh, the phone keeper. Even, even multi-type. No, no. no. how All many right, bins so have you got at, at home? home yeah. At home, yeah. I've got a recycling bin. One. I've got um, the the uh, bin for the Two. garden waste. Two. I've got a bin for the normal, Three. Sort of, you know, Three. waste. And, Three bins. Oh, and then the food bin and Four. then a the cardboard Five. bin. Five. Five. Yeah. That's all right. If it wasn't for Rishi Sinat, you'd still have seven. <laughs> True. But, you know, this we're talking about schools now, so... We are. Um, but oh, it's it, an odd it's one, just, isn't it? It's, I don't, it's, 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 it's such a strange one. That, that I don't it's mean, a strange one. And also, I think a lot of parents, um, um, they, they're also... I think that your last caller seems to think they know that your child is different at school. Your child is different at school. Yes. Your, you know, your child is different at school. And I will have parents say, oh, they wouldn't have taken their phone out. They wouldn't have done this. They wouldn't have done... They do. I know. I know. I mean, crikey. Uh, not all of them, actually. I, 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 my, my, well, I was about to say, I was much naughtier than my parents realised, but they kind of got quite a few reminders. And indeed, quite a few discoveries. But but yes, in terms of w- what you're doing with your phone, the child is going to do whatever they want and then tell their parents whatever they think their parents want to hear. Thank you, phone keeper. That was, uh, that, that was a very helpful contribution to the conversation, albeit that it adds to the general consensus that Gillian Keegan is just... Well, Carl in Liverpool goes a little further. She said, James, it's a cynical win. Gillian Keegan can claim that she's got phones out of schools because phones are already out of schools. How, would you put it past them? Back, she could say, back in February, I said that we must get phones out of schools. It's now May, and phones are out of schools. Don't mention that they were out of schools in January, except the schools where they're not, where they're still not. She will ride on the grief of Esther Jai to achieve a political win, is the suggestion there. I, I, I think it's a grim accusation, Carl, but I don't know... I don't know that I can defend her against it. The timing is uh, certainly no coincidence. The cynicism is clear to see. It's 11.45. Rachel Clark in next. Dr. Rachel Clark, I should say. You will know her probably from from Twitter or from her rather splendid uh, full disclosure appearance a couple of years ago or indeed from her book. But she is the author of, well, rather the book which she wrote, Breathtaking, has inspired a TV programme which... It's going to do something an awful lot of you have been telling me you wish someone would do with regard to how hospitals coped or didn't cope with the outbreak of COVID-19. And I think we forget, don't we, the disconnect between political discourse and health service reality. Someone sent me, and I never thank people for doing this, but someone sent me a reminder of something Daniel Hannan once said. Daniel Hannan, in many ways, in many ways, the perfect exemplar of what's happened to our country in the last few years. Daniel Hannan, remarkably and consistently wrong about absolutely everything. He was the one that tweeted, the pandemic isn't going to kill you, which, of course, is a tweet that could have reached everybody who subsequently was killed by COVID-19. But Daniel Hannan tweeting that at times, at precisely the time when people like uh, Rachel Clark were trying to deal with the realities of what was happening on on the wards so they've turned it into an itv drama and i think quite a lot of people will be hoping for what we might call a a a bit of the uh mr bates versus the post office effect rachel will be with me after this james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc it's nine minutes to 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I don't know if you follow me on Twitter. Oh, actually, I should, I should, I, if you follow me, if you don't follow me on Twitter, you could get me over 1.2 million today. I know what you're thinking. James, this is far more important than any of the other issues that you've been discussing on the program today. But uh, yeah, just checking on the numbers. Someone, Michael, I think it was, sent me a lovely message pointing out I'm very close to 1.2 million. I thought things were going to drop off completely when Elon Musk bought it. So there's some big news for you. If you don't follow out Mr. James O'B on Twitter today, then you could help me. 1.1992. So I'm about 799 followers short of 1.2 million. That would be a nice little thing for Monday, wouldn't it? I could be, you know, you could, wouldn't it be nice to get home today and think I actually achieved something today? I helped James get to 1.2 million followers on Twitter. And when you get home, make an appointment to, uh, to, to, uh, to watch telly tonight because Rachel Clark's book has been turned into the latest ITV drama. And Rachel's just reminded me that we did our full disclosure interview on, um, 
on Zoom. I'd forgotten. I thought we'd met before. And that's a reminder of, of just how boiled our brains are from, from that period. And I'm just a gob on a stick in a radio station. You, you, of course, were on the front line. Tell people who don't know what breathtaking sought to achieve. So it was really simple. We wanted to show the public what really unfolded behind the closed doors of our NHS hospitals during the pandemic. Um, And the reason we wanted to do that was because it's just, it's almost four years down the line since the pandemic began. And it is so hard to remember what it was like then, let alone imagine what it was like for NHS staff when you really had no idea what those experiences were like. Um, I look back now and I can hardly believe that all of a sudden we were working in a hospital and the air we were breathing was filled with a virus that could kill us. I had colleagues coming up to me asking me to witness signing their wills because they were so frightened of dying and they were right to be frightened because sure enough we soon had members of staff in intensive care dying and and all of that I think has been to some extent forgotten we like to move on from traumatic experiences forgotten presumes it was fully appreciated at the time Uh, because the the period you're describing coincides with people like daniel now lord hannan telling us that nobody was going to die and boris johnson appearing on television to suggest that we just let it sort of run through the population like a dose of salt so how how, how key is that dichotomy between political discourse and lived experience on the wards it's in it's incredibly important and we use archive in the series precisely as a bridge between those two worlds so what you the public were hearing and what we nhs staff were experiencing and it was just it was just horrifying the mismatch between the two so you know we had to listen to matt hancock standing up and telling <laughs> telling the, the the nation that there were no problems with ppe when we were getting visors made by local school children and masks from local veterinary practices because literally we weren't getting them from the nhs we had to listen to him saying he'd thrown a protective ring around yeah. care homes when we knew that care home residents had just been thrown to the wolves. And I think worst of all was this claim, and, and Boris Johnson loved to say this, another example of world-beating policies, that the NHS wasn't overwhelmed. We'd successfully protected the NHS. It was nonsense. It was absolutely horrific. We can have a little listen to a small um, a small clip, actually, that I think makes some of the points that you've just made and, and demonstrates the, the, the sort of deployment of of, of, of drama that, that you have gone with. We will make sure the NHS gets all the support it needs. Morning. Just had a call from LAS. Might be the first one. I'm not going to make it home this weekend. Sorry, it's just it's madness. There's currently no PPE at all. They were overwhelmed. The virus is always going to be ahead. Trust the guidelines. This is insane. Robin, where's the deep end? Where's the gas trolley? The public can be assured that we have a clear plan. There's no plan. Members of our team are wearing bin bags and going home wondering if they're going to die in the night. Don't go there. We're already there. You know this thing is spreading. They just keep coming. But no one is giving up. Prepare for the worst. But hope for the best. Oh. I, I'm, nine o'clock tonight, ITV One. It's an appointment to watch, isn't it? I, I, can we talk briefly, Rachel, about that? The difference between I could do a hundred phone-ins. In fact, I did, and not have anything like the impact that a good drama can have. And and of course, the book it's based on was not a story. Was I mean, it wasn't it wasn't fiction. It wasn't a, a, a dramatization. It didn't have a a narrative arc in the sense that the. the no, the, the TV it, it, program needs to have. Why do you think that? I mean, I presume I can answer the first question, which is: Does it bother you that drama has so much more impact than journalism or, or, or non-fiction writing, as, as, as you've done? And the answer will be no. Of course, it doesn't bother me. If it works, it works. But the second question is: Why do you think that is? Why is that so much more powerful than me sitting here on the radio? Maybe every now and then someone will ring in who is in the eye of the storm and reaches the parts that normal journalism can't reach. But Mm -hmm. as with the Mr. Bates versus the post office, 
this is going to reach parts mm. that no journalism has managed to reach. I think it's because there is a world of difference between understanding the facts of a situation and then actually feeling them in a way that means you care about them, you engage. And strangely, I see this as a doctor as well as a writer. We're creatures of story. We make sense of our lives through the stories we tell ourselves. And sometimes as a palliative care doctor, you can transform a patient's life by helping them see themselves not as somebody whose life is written off, they're going to die, but someone who still has meaning and the possibility of of love and, and goodness mm. in their life. And I think with this, when you see our lead character, Abby, Dr. Abby Henderson, named after my daughter, played by <laughs> Joanne Froggatt, <laughs> with all her frailty and vulnerability and strength and determination and flaws and strengths, going forward, walking towards the danger in her pitiful substandard PPE, it just wrenches your heart in a way that something ac academic or journalistic can't. can't and you care and your heart is moved by it. And that's what I want to happen most of all. I want people's hearts to be moved because we need to remember this. We cannot forget it. It would do our NHS a disservice and all the people who died as well. I'm not sure I've ever heard anyone answer one of my questions quite quite so perfectly. Do you, do you dare let yourself hope for even more? I, I mean, you've mentioned some politicians. They've already walked away. Johnson literally, Matt Hancock imminently, the, the list of senior Conservatives who presided over this debacle, um, who are staying in Parliament after the yeah. next election, whether the, whatever the voters decide, most of them are hitting the road of their own volition. Do you, do you dare hope for consequences, either as a result of people being mobilised by watching this, or by the on continuing COVID inquiry? Well, m m much as I have contempt for many of the individuals involved and I think um, after his uh, little stint eating testicles and I'm a celebrity there is no bound to my mm. contempt for Matt Hancock in particular uh, I don't think those individuals are what really matters fundamentally okay. what matters is two things one how do we do things better and yeah. more safely next time it's the patients who count and two and maybe this is fanciful, but I don't want to believe it is. How do we how do we refuse to allow our politicians to tell us these debased narratives that play fast and loose with the truth at a time of global pandemic, mm. the one time when the truth matters more than anything and we have to trust our leaders. We have to listen to nonsense being spouted by by these politicians on the airwaves. How is it that we have got to this debased state in our politics? I just want political leaders who tell the truth, and it shouldn't be outlandish to want that. Not especially not in these sort of circumstances. Thank you, Rachel. I, actually, on the, on that subject, I don't think this is something that you tackle in the in the drama. I, I mean, that's a sort of sanctions nonsense. The, the, the politicians claiming things are being done when they're not claiming everything's okay when it isn't you could almost make a propaganda based case for it and say well you've got to keep people's peckers mm. up and you know you've got to keep calm and carry Matt Hancock on. kept his pecker up thank you very much Rachel I presume that doesn't feature in there. certainly not <laughs> that's a relief what about the absolutely crazy stuff what about the people who will be texting me imminently to tell me there was no such thing as COVID absolutely and they'll be tweeting to me yes. calling for me to be hanged at Nuremberg I'm they sorry, do love yeah. their, their, their death threats these people so so this is another really important point at a time when our hospitals were overwhelmed with covid patients when we were rationing ventilators we didn't even have enough ambulances hospitals were nearly running out of oxygen we simultaneously had people taking to social media actually setting out to misinform and deceive the public saying it's a scamdemic, yeah. COVID's not a real disease, hospitals are empty, actually the doctors are doing the killing, not the virus. And of course, something has gone radically wrong in our public discourse that these people can gain so much traction telling the public messages that are absolutely categorically wrong. And deeply um, dangerous, deathly. Deep, deeply dangerous. And I, and I think one of the lessons in that respect, perhaps for NHS England um, and the Department of Health, 
is the importance of candour. If you're not honest with the public, if you don't show the public what's really going on, then you've created a vacuum into which these guys can step in. These guys, indeed. Uh, apropos nothing in particular, it has been announced this morning that Ofcom has launched an investigation into the Prime Minister's appearance on GBBs, where um, I think there are now some people spouting precisely the sort of stuff that you have uh, just, yeah. just alluded to. Yeah. It's a brilliant book. Um, it's a rather good episode of Full Disclosure that you could uh, that you could access. And someone, and I don't normally recommend the opposition, but uh, it, 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 James in Northampton is keen that I do. Can I recommend that your listeners find Rachel's appearance on BBC Three's Private Passions? Yes. Because yes. he says, I believe it's still available. It is without doubt one of the most emotionally charged and uplifting programmes I've ever heard. And James listens to this every day, so his standards are very high. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, or yours are slipping, James. <laughs> exactly. It could be that. It could be that. So, breathtaking episode one is on ITV at nine o'clock tonight. Don't, just don't miss it. Just, just, just watch it. That's all. Okay. Thank you. No, thank Thanks you, Rachel much. Clark. And of course, the book of breathtaking, presumably coming out with a with a new cover and an as seen on TV sticker. Totally. That's <laughs> what we like. That's right. Knocking me clearly out of the non-fiction charts. That's what we like to see. It is three minutes after twelve. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Seven after twelve. A, a bit of a change of pace coming up. But you know, before that, I, I'm a bit inspired by Rachel Clark. I often find myself wondering these days whether it's worth returning to uh, trodden territory, whether it's worth returning to, to some of the stuff I've spent years, or so, certainly some of the stuff that I spent years banging you over the head with while Brexit was running wild and Boris Johnson either had his sights on Downing Street or, God forbid, was was actually in it. But I think Rachel's right, isn't she? We all have a responsibility to, to keep the truth alive. And so I would crave a moment of your time to remind you of Boris Johnson's relationship with uh, Russian supporters of Vladimir Putin because he inevitably attempted this weekend to uh, express sympathy for the murdered uh, I, I don't even know what, right, what the right word is to use about Alexei Navalny, because if you say critic, it makes him sound like someone who's reviewing last night's television in the Daily Bugle, but a political opponent for, for Vladimir Putin's imprisoned political opponent, because it does occasionally still stagger me that the media politics ecosystem in this country is so completely corrupt that Boris Johnson can tweet his condolences to Alexei's family without censure or without anybody pointing out how supremely and hideously hypocritical that actually is. So I'd like to begin in Salisbury when two of Vladimir Putin's uh, goons made an attempt upon the life of the Skripals, uh, a father and daughter who had fled Vladimir Putin's Russia and found sanctuary here. Now, they failed in their attempt to kill the, the, the Skripals. They succeeded accidentally in killing a woman whose name is often overlooked in these circumstances. And her name was Dawn Sturgis, a mother of one who died as a, as a consequence of, of coming across the agent that, that Putin's goons had tried to kill the Skripals with. Um, Sergei and Yulia, I think. And... As Foreign Secretary, right, this, I, I, if you don't know this story, then I, I don't think you're going to believe me. If you don't know this story already, I honestly think you're going to think I've either got my wires crossed or that I'm making it up for political reasons. Okay? So in April of 2018... Boris Johnson, as Foreign Secretary, attended a NATO meeting in which the attempt upon the Skripal's life was to be discussed, and indeed was discussed. On his way back from that meeting, which I think was in Paris, he detoured to Italy, detoured to Perugia in Italy, and... Against the advice of his officials, or rather it is believed that against the advice of his officials, he dispensed with the 24-7 security detail that is usually assigned to the Foreign Secretary. Right? 
I think the only bit that's not known is whether or not it was against the advice of his officials. It is a matter of fact that the Foreign Secretary ordinarily has a 24-7 security detail assigned to him or to her. Once in Italy, he made his way to the castle of a man called Lebedev. Now, there are two Lebedevs in this story, the father and the son. The father is currently sanctioned by some countries, including Canada, one of one of the Five Eyes nations, i.e. a country with whom we share all of our, or with whom we are supposed to share our intelligence. He is sanctioned for being, and I think I quote, it's from memory, so forgive me if I make any mistakes, a member of Vladimir Putin's inner circle. Now, Boris Johnson, having dispensed with his security detail, on the way back from a meeting where Vladimir Putin's attempt upon the lives of Sergei and Yulia Skripal and accidental murder of Dawn Sturgis was under discussion, spent two days in this castle in Italy. And it was a couple of years before, thanks to the efforts of Carol Cadwallader and others, it was finally established that Lebedev Sr. had been present. I'm going to say that again, because there are some people in the Conservative Party that think he's somehow worthy of a comeback. And there are some people in the, well, and Paul Dacre still thinks he's worthy of a column in the Daily Mail. I'm going to say that again. On his way back from a summit where the attempted murder of two British citizens by the Russian government had been under discussion, the foreign secretary from the British government went to a party for two days at the home of, or the home of the son of, I haven't seen the property deeds, a man currently sanctioned for being a member of Vladimir Putin's inner circle. Now, we do not know what went on at that party. All we know is that a couple of days later, he was photographed by members of the public at San Francesco d'Assisi Airport, looking, shall we say, the worse for wear. Um, according to one passenger on the flight, he didn't even seem to have any luggage. According to me, who has sent some of the photographs by one of my listeners, he looked like he'd slept in a hedge. Now, I grant you, in Boris Johnson's case, that's par for the course. But even by his sartorial standards, and I speak as a lifelong scruff, he looked absolutely broken. So God only knows what went on at that party. Oh, I, forgive me. Of course, not only God knows what went on at that party. Uh, other guests will have an inkling, but crucially, the host will know exactly what went on at that party. And that's the man who this weekend attempted to express public condolences for the murder of Alexei Navalny by precisely the same people who tried to murder the Skripals. That's Boris Johnson. So you look me in the eye and tell me there's not something seriously wrong with this country. Because albeit that he is a disgraced former prime minister, the best-selling newspaper in the country is still the Daily Mail. Everyone in broadcasting, up to and including the BBC, still take their lead some mornings when deciding what's in the news and what's on the agenda from the newspapers. And there is the best-selling newspaper in the country still promoting a disgraced former prime minister who elected to spend two days partying with a KGB spy, brackets, former close brackets, currently sanctioned for being a member of Vladimir Putin's inner circle, having jettisoned his 24-7 security detail before heading home looking as though he had been dragged through several hedges backwards. That's the man. That's Boris Johnson. Oh, and this is Ian Hislop, who I think we can all agree knows what he's talking about. I can see a slight feeling of ennui at the, these revelations, but they are fairly startling. I mean, it, it does say that the, the Conservative Party is almost entirely funded by Russian oligarchs, most of whom are actually sanctioned. Um, they're not allowed, um, you know, to uh, have any normal relations with normal people, which I know doesn't rule out the Conservative Party, but it, it, <laughs> it does make you worry that, you know, our leading political party, which is in government, is entirely funded, almost entirely funded, by foreign nationals who don't have our interests at heart. I mean, I know it's a boring story, but it is sort of... Yeah touch worrying but the last two conservative governments have promised to make offshore dealings more transparent um and cameron said he would and may said that they would and every conservative government has promised 
And the fact that most of their money comes from offshore is obviously not the reason why they don't do anything. <laughs> no bias here, Nadine. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot the uh, conclusion to that story, which is, of course, that against the advice of the relevant bodies... When he became Prime Minister, Boris Johnson put the son of that KGB spy I was just telling you about in the House of Lords. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 19 minutes after 12 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, um, I, I, I get ambushed sometimes by you. Uh, I love the conversations that go in directions I was absolutely not expecting. And one of the best examples of that recently was when some emails by or from Helen McNamara were revealed by the COVID inquiry. You'll, you'll, you'll remember that she was addressing the then NHS or, or at senior NHS England um, panjandrum. And she was the deputy cabinet secretary at the, at the, at the time. And the very first line of her email said, just when you thought you were out of the woods on annoying emails from me. And a journalist, a brilliant journalist, called uh, Jane Merrick and others picked up on this um, and pointed out that what it did was demonstrate how women, much more than men, in, in fact, I think that no men are ever really accused of this, routinely make themselves smaller or use self-deprecating humour, almost become apologetic, simply in this case for doing their job. The brilliant Lucy Eastope, in fact, it's like a, a, a roll call of inspirational women today, isn't it? You've got uh, Rachel Clark just leaving the studio and me citing Lucy Eastope, who, who um, is also the author of a brilliant non-fiction, but when the dust settles and, and, and was also a rather wonderful guest on... Full disclosure, but uh, Lucy wrote a piece about it that I thought was brilliant. Um, and, and, and she said, as women, we make ourselves smaller. We use humour. We lower our voice and our tone. We do everything we can to not look hysterical. We contort. I'm also a senior academic, and it would be one of the first differences I would note in my students. The female students are conditioned to always begin and end with an apology, and the male students simply don't. Um, she writes about being profiled by the New Yorker and being observed in a training room full of emergency responders. Um, and they, even, the New Yorker picked up on her use of humour, self-deprecation, gentle flattery to soften the semantic blows she was about to deliver. So the point here is that we praise men for being, what would the word be, you know, for, we praise men for being a, a, a aggressive, perhaps certainly assertive, we praise men for calling a spade a spade. And yet the women who are most effective in the same public space seem to be women who have mastered the art of self-deprecation or lowering their tone or even perhaps adopting an apologetic demeanour. I love this line from Lucy Eastope. We do everything we can to not look hysterical. Um, a, a, another uh, tweeter picked up on that, saying, full of apologies, full of deference. I think this was Jane, actually. Full of self-deprecation and emojis so they don't hate us. When will women in some of the most senior positions in the land be able to stop writing emails like this? And it was extraordinary. The email began, just when you thought you were out of the woods on annoying emails from me, has the PPE conversation picked up the fact that most PPE isn't designed for female bodies and yet the overwhelming majority of people who need PPE are women i'll go for the hat trick of inspirational women now and remind you of Ca caroline criado perez's book which is literally about how the world is made for men one of the most powerful examples she uses is that of crash test dummies so when they were designing cars to protect humans from the impact of a crash they were using crash test dummies that were built to male specifications so women were immediately the average woman was immediately less safe in a car crash than the average man because the safety uh measures had been designed according to the uh, biology, if you like, or the or the what's the word I'm looking for? The build of the of the average male. That's three women right there. So you got you got Rachel, you've got Lucy, and you've got Caroline Criado Perez. Read all three of their books, and I'll tell you what you could you could do a hell of a lot worse. And 
and of course, and she's also been on full disclosure just to go for the full set. Sometimes worry that we don't have enough women on full disclosure, but you know that, that's a nice little bit of evidence to the contrary. And I mentioned that because Rachel was just telling us about PPE. So even as they were struggling to get good PPE while pretending that it was all going swimmingly, the PPE they were getting that could have been filed under good was built to the dimensions. That was the word that I wanted. Built to the dimensions of the average bloke. So the average woman, or perhaps an even smaller than average woman, would be suffering as a consequence of PPE being designed. So it's an enormously important issue. 77% of NHS staff are female. 89% of nurses are female. But the PPE was designed for men. And even when raising it with supposed superiors, this incredibly successful woman felt the need to be almost apologetic. Just when you thought you were out of the woods on annoying emails, so the point she is rise, raising could save lives. But she feels the need as a woman to moderate her tone, to contour. A man would write an email that went in precisely the opposite direction. I can't believe I have to tell you this. It should have been actioned months, if not years ago. But PPE is currently designed for men when 89% of our workforce is female. Please resolve this imminently or heads will roll or something like that. I don't know. It's a while since I had a management position. But I'm right. You know I am. And that really popped into my mind today when I turned the page of, a, of, of my newspaper and read that girls need lessons in being less polite Girls need lessons in how to take up more space in the workplace. It's uh, a peon to single-sex schools, as perhaps you might expect, because it is written by the head and the deputy head of two private schools in London. But that is no reason to disregard their comments. It is precisely because girls at single-sex schools can be taught to be more assertive and forthright in their careers, as well as excelling academically. There's a, a full range of contributors who, who make the same point creatively and repeatedly. It is the idea that when there are men in the room, women behave differently and men don't. And I just want really to know your experiences of that more than your thoughts. When I say to you, Girls need lessons in being less polite and how to take up more space in the workplace. And you go, hell yes. I want you to tell me why. I want you to tell me what, what happens. Because here's the fear, right? I also work more with women than with men, certainly over the last few years. Um, the majority of my producers have been women. And... Speaking to my female producer today, she pointed out that this will not make you popular, particularly if you're in the vanguard of this kind of movement. If you become, and I, 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 I find myself thinking two things. I find myself thinking, yeah, this is brilliant. This is great. Uh, resist the urge to say, as the father of daughters, but fail to resist the urge. As the father of daughters, I think this is a brilliant idea. But how would I feel at work? I mean, you should absolutely do it anyway, as, as, as my producer was adamant about, but be prepared for some negative reactions, possibly even from self-congratulatory frauds like me. I, I don't know. What do I react back best, best to in the workplace? The assertive, less polite woman? I'd love to believe that I will respond to you identically, regardless of whether you are male, female, or neither. But I don't know, hand on heart, I don't know. I do know this, I'm supremely unqualified to comment on what it's like to be a woman in this situation. And what we need is to put flesh upon the bones of the theory. So as with Helen McNamara's email, I want you to tell me whether you've just nodded in recognition, whether you've been taken by surprise by the recognition that when you're at work... You are not authentic because you are, to use Lucy Easthope's wonderful verb, you are contorting yourself to fit, 
if you like. You are making yourself smaller. Isn't that interesting? So in the Helen McNamara story, Lucy wrote, we make ourselves smaller. As women, we make ourselves smaller. And the new book specifically addresses the need to take up more space in the workplace. We make ourselves smaller. You need to take up more space in the workplace. What does it mean in, in real life, in your life? What does that actually mean? 03456060973. The female students always begin and even end their contributions in class with an apology. Have you noticed my callers do it? So a, a female caller will say to me, I, I, I'm sorry, or they might say, oh, I'm not going to be as good as the previous contributors, and they're always better. Or not always. But they are often better. You are often better. And yet that conditioning see it's like a sort of it's like a milder version of me too this for men it's something that is unfolding every single moment of every single day under our very noses and it's something that were we made aware of it we would be adamant that it was wrong and yet we don't even notice so what should we be noticing O three four five six zero six zero nine seven three is the number that you need. When these head teachers combine forces to explain that girls need lessons in being less polite, and that they need lessons in how to take up more space in the workplace, what are they actually describing? What does that look like? Being less polite, and do you even notice? Have you ever made a conscious decision to do it? I wonder. And what happens when you do? Because, forgive me for engaging in stereotypes, but the, shall we say, the, the, the giggling eyelash flutterer over there in some workplaces may move a little faster through the ranks than you do, insisting upon every T being crossed and every I being dotted, and insisting upon being treated as a full equal of your male colleagues. I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking out loud about the things we might have missed, but I'd love to speak to you today if you are nodding along in recognition at what is being described in this case. And, and not for the first time. There is, of course, a fast show sketch. We did one a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? Um, uh, and I don't know that I agree with this, and I don't know whether it's from, a, from, a, from a, a, a man or a woman, but it says men should be taught to be more polite. Another example of women having to adapt. I think, you've, I think that must be from a man. Or, forgive me, whoever it's from, you've completely missed the point. So women are adapting <laughs> in order to fit in. The, 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 the advice is stop contorting, stop bending, stop changing and be more authentic be yourself be more assertive be less polite 0345 6060 is the number that you need um and and i'll read this quickly i have to disagree james i think women should definitely be taught to be confident in their abilities but in my experience the hostile uh, correspondence i've received at work is equal between men and women but maybe women have to overcompensate because of the points you've raised and that with no no offense because we're all capable of doing it that that is I, I, again i presume from someone who's either missing the point or failing to take off their bloke tickles. Does that work as a phrase? Bloke tickles? Chapticles. The things, the lenses through which you can only see the world from a masculine point of view. 32 minutes after 12 is the time. Tim Humphrey has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, all right. Bloke tickles doesn't work, obviously. I, I should probably have seen that coming. Stephen in Milton Keynes perhaps put it best. He says, I had a small operation on my bloke tickles after my wife and I had our second baby. All right, so we'll drop that. Brad has come up with this, and I'm nicking it and pretending it's all my own work. He's told me that I can. Bros tinted glasses. Bros tinted glasses, yeah? So you can only see the world through your through the masculine lenses before your eyes they are called bros tinted glasses i love that um listen before home time today i must tell you about this story my favorite story of the day involves well you tell me actually you have a think about it One hundred and thirty thousand pounds worth of stolen bikes found in such a simple and straightforward way that i have suggested to you when talking about 
stolen bikes. And we spoke to a wonderful couple, didn't we, who had tracked their own bikes down to Poland or something. Like, they were top of the range bikes, obviously. It wasn't just some manky old chopper um, or a broken grifter. So they tra- So I know how you could do this. I'm sure I said to you at the time, I know how you could find... If, if there's a bike theft epidemic in your area, chances are that it's orchestrated and coordinated and the same sort of characters behind it. I know exactly how you could solve this. And the police finally, in one part of London, have actually got around from it. In fact, it's the biggest haul of its kind in the police force's history. And I, without reading the article, knew exactly how they did it. And I'll tell you before Sheila gets here at one o'clock. Uh, But first, this notion of women, girls, needing to be taught, or it would be a good idea to teach you to be less polite and how to take up more space in the workplace. Katie's in Anglesey. Katie, what would you like to say? Um, I worked in construction as a project manager for 15 years, and I was often told I was being hysterical. Um, It was my time of the month, um, or I was a lesbian, uh, or I was shouting too much, and often advised if I was nicer and more feminine, I'd get more. I'd get more results on site. Um, and well, after you, fifteen years, I quit. You're the perfect first caller on this, then, aren't you? Because you are doing what the advice tells young women to do, but you're also proving my producer's point that the vanguard or the first cohort of women doing this are unlikely to have a very pleasant experience. So. What's your overview, that you would now behave differently, less authentically, in order to avoid the insults and the abuses that you describe? Or someone's got to do it, but it ain't, it's a dirty job, and someone's got to do it, but it ain't going to be me anymore? Well, I go around schools trying to inspire young ladies to speak up, be individual. Right. So um, you couldn't cope with it anymore. C- cope's not the right word, is it? You you wouldn't put up with well, it anymore. They weren't going to change. You were damned if you were going to change, but you still recognise the wisdom of this advice. Yeah, it comes to the point where it affects your health. I had a stroke at 35 with mm. all the stress of it. So um, you have to... We need to empower the next generation just to be individual and just accept people. But in the meantime, we have to support young women to feel empowered enough to do these jobs. I I went into another male industry. I became a farmer after that. So I'm a glutton for punishment, yeah. Well, I mean, mean, you work more with animals than men, don't you, when you're a farmer? (laughs) I don't know if you've ever met a bull, James. (laughs) Yeah, but you've got, for every bull, Katie, you've got several cows. (laughs) That's how it works, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, my husband would agree. (laughs) So it is, it's, 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 oh, and you know, I wonder also, I didn't spot this element to it because these are head teachers in private girls' schools Mm. who perhaps have a slightly more rarefied sphere of experience than you would do on a building site. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's really difficult. Do you miss it? (laughs) Oh, with every single fibre of my body. The job. You miss the job. job. The job itself. But the company was unbearable. I was really good at my job. I bet you were. I bet you were. Uh, that's it. That, well, you're, you're, the, you're the perfect case study, really. That You know what the right thing to do is, but in a world where you stand out, in a world where people, A, aren't used to females in the role that you held, but B, certainly not used to being spoken to by females in exactly the same way as they would be spoken to by a male. That's, that's the point. And that's where the suggestion that men need to change as well does become irresistible because you, you simply have to say, how would I feel if a man spoke to me like that? And if the answer is, I wouldn't have any problem at all, then you are a huge part of the problem that, that essentially chased Katie out of her own beloved job. Hannah's in Ashford. Hannah, what would you like to say? I can com- Hi, James. Hello. Hello. Um, I can completely relate to what Katie was just saying. I was in education for 16 years and actually left recently because of this. Really? Yep. Yep. Tell me more. So I was a very successful uh, award-winning teacher and senior leader. And I worked in an environment with brilliant women, truly brilliant women, who all in some way, including myself, diminished our own kind of achievements and what we were doing in order to kind of try and get our voices across. The irony, of course, is that in education, it's a predominantly female. um, But but you still have men taking up more space in the workplace, do you? Oh, absolutely. What does that mean? Tell me what that phrase means to you. 
I think what it means is the male voices in the room, in some rooms, not in all rooms, sure. but in some rooms, um, dominated. And when you would leave that meeting, the male voices would turn from the agenda that you were talking to about to she's hysterical, she's talking a bit emotional, you. she's a bit sensitive. Oh, well, we won't do what, what she thinks. And it would always be... You know, the the things that my colleagues and I would be coming up with would be evidence-based, research-informed, this is why we'd like to do this, this is a very clear rationale, and it would often be completely dismissed. Um, oh. So there's a, there's a really ta- like weird tacit irony between trying to empower young girls within your education, ed- education setting and then doing it to your leaders and your teachers. <sighs> And it, and it was really, really uh, pervasive. I can understand. It, I can see yeah. it. I can hear it. Actually, it. <laughs> it was across all levels. Yeah. Like it's not. It's not even just. You know, this is my experience. But a lot of other female leaders uh, and teachers who I've worked with left for the same reason. And this doesn't reflect what's going on in every in every education setting of course not no but, but i bet I it's come, happening more often than it's not for the reasons well, that you describe yeah yeah it's you know look looking at particularly things like academy trusts that are corporate entities that are sometimes managed by a, a predominantly male board you know there, yeah. there's lots of different there's lots of different contexts for this but It is damaging. I'm one of three girls um, and me and my sisters. My sister's a civil engineer and project manager. She's very accomplished. My other sister's very high up in the NHS. You know, um, yet all of us in some ways have had quite similar experiences of this. Um, Now I'm working in the private sector in an organisation where I do feel valued and I would encourage every woman to use their voice and take up as much space so as is appropriate. Yeah, I see the problem is, is, is for me, and if I'm being really, really honest and possibly yeah. a, a exposing myself to justified criticism, the, 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 I, I think I would react differently to an overbearing man than I would to an overbearing woman. But I don't want anyone to be overbearing. So it's not about encouraging people like you to be overbearing, is it? It's it's about encouraging you to move through the gears without getting to that one, I think. Well, you obviously didn't need to be encouraged, but it's about encouraging young women to move through the gears of whatever you want to call it, taking up more space in the workplace without becoming the female equivalent of the office bore, B-O-O-R. Yeah, it's. I think a lot of women inherently, and I could be wrong, mm. but certainly the women that I worked with, I think you become very adept at, at uh, very adept, sorry, at code switching. Yeah, you know, like you know how to code switch in different situations. Yeah, it's a great sometimes phrase. sometimes it's easier to just not say anything because when you do, there's a difference between that kind of message and receiver. You know, you can send the message out to somebody, but it's how it's going to be received. And sometimes you just know instinctively, or I certainly did in, in the room, you learn how when not to speak yeah, because yeah. it either wouldn't benefit the the discussion that was happening or could cause some kind of conflict later down the line. And that is the lesson that men never have to learn. They never, they never have to go there, really. I, I, well, I don't think they worry as much. I think a lot of meetings we would come out of and we'd be like, oh my, you know, what did I just say? Was it right? Did I say the right? Was the tone right? Did I come across as being too assertive? Because that can be really difficult. Mm. Did I come across as being you know, too passionate, because people would often call me passionate. They go, oh, you're so passionate. But that actually felt detrimental and not something that was positive. And um, that that's another thing. It's about how your own language often can get used back to you, but changed. So I think code switching is something that I learned a lot of. Um, and I saw a lot of it. And, and could you call colleagues. code switching would be another phrase to describe seeking approval? Um, to a certain extent, yeah, yeah. I think I think you could go into a certain context, a different type of meeting, use a slightly different language. You know, everybody has to do it. Male colleagues had to do it as well. Um, okay. I just want to yes. advocate for some of some of my male colleagues because they they too had to do it, depending on the environment. But I found more that women 
we're a lot more self-deprecating a lot we've apologized all the time oh i'm sorry can i just ask for your time oh, i'm sorry yeah i just need to ask you this one thing oh i'm so sorry and it was always all, all the time sorry. Oh, you hear it on the phones you hear it here actually and, and it, this isn't even a working for well it is for me supposedly but it's not for you it's not supposed to be at least <laughs> hannah thank you a lot of people i'll just read you what marion said while you were speaking this caller is so very spot on and you can't say fairer than that it's, but, but the, i mean it's obviously not fixed in a day is it there's it's, it's more oil tanker turning around than rome being built but the the notion of it being detrimental to everybody is, is pretty hard to resist. It means that you are you are operating, the whole team is operating suboptimally when you have such a baked-in inequality um, in, in, in the workplace. And yet half of the people in the room won't even have noticed it. And the other half aren't drawing attention to it because, well, for precisely the reasons that we've just been discussing. It's 12.48. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. So here it is, as promised, you could break up every single bike thieving ring in the country by tea time today by doing what the City of London Police Force have not only done, but given a two-page interview to a newspaper marvelling at what geniuses they are. Detective Constable Matt Cooper could hardly believe what he was seeing. Row upon row of the most expensive and sought-after bicycles in the UK, all snatched from the City of London, some whole, others in pieces, in what amounted to the biggest haul of its kind in the police force's history. What do you think they did? Do you know? Do you know? It's so obvious. I'll tell you before home time, I promise. Caroline's in Glasgow. Caroline, what would you like to say? Hello, Hello. James. Good morning, or afternoon. <laughs> Either, somewhere. Whatever. Um, uh, yeah, so I actually don't work in an office anymore, as I was telling your researcher, your hmm. producer, but um, one thing that I work hard on is retraining myself to write emails more confidently. That's where most of my um, communication with clients yes. is through email. So saying, for example, instead of saying, sorry for the delay, yeah. you say, thank you for your patience. Ah, okay. Or sorry for making a mistake, a mission, you know, something like that. You say, thanks for bringing that to my attention. And then you assert, you know, assert the problem and, and fix it. But I, like I that. think, yeah, the it's kind of, you know, it's like an infographic thing that I saw online, but it's something so small that really seems like such a minuscule thing, but I think in a sort of fake it till, till you make it way, it does give you more confidence. To, it's tone. To it changes the tone of your internal dialogue exactly. almost, or your internal monologue. And once the tone of the internal monologue is changed by effort, it becomes second nature externally. So you cease to be... What was it like when you did work in an office? Did you catch yourself doing it in IRL, as it were, as opposed to just in text? Uh, I would say definitely. My uh, the office I worked in was um, a special case, probably. But um, what do you it, mean? Was, <laughs> it was just me and two other gentlemen. Okay. So three three person office, really tiny startup. So there's a lot of pressure there, obviously. Sure. But they had established it um, as a sort of you know friendly, quite laid back atmosphere. Um, and I you know let myself settle into that and felt comfortable. Yes. But unfortunately then my more sort of carefree comments and attitude were actually thrown back at me in my review. Oh. Uh, when I, yeah, by my boss, that he said, oh, well, remember you said this this one time, remember you said this. Um, for example, that, so I'd been signed up for a training that they wanted me to do, and they said, oh, are you excited to go to this training course? And I said, well, kind of, but you did tell me that the, the trainer is, not very good at what they do, so I'm not really looking forward to that. <laughs> so they don't want to hear that. They just want you to go along, nod along with it. Yeah, great idea. I can't wait to go off on this course with someone you told me was rubbish. So it is. Yeah. It's like you're causing ructions, even though they're entirely justified, and a male male colleague, male boss objects to it. And the, yeah, and then in my review, he said, "Oh, well, you know, remember you said that." So I don't think you're really committed to this job. <laughs> Crikey. Okay, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I guess we'd need to know whether or not male colleague was being treated in a in a similar way. I think we both suspect not, but the the conclusive proof would be in the eating. Caroline, thank you. Um, uh, Twelve fifty five is the time. Let's go to Anne, who's in Dendermonde. And what would you like to say, all the way from Belgium? I'd like to say that it goes wider than just schools. I think the most oh, important surely, thing is yes. that women. And, well, girls and women are taught that being liked is not the beginning and end all. Because when you start 
stop you stop cushioning or start stop being agreeable before everything your promotion doesn't get stopped you get promoted because you're good at your job and they can't deny that do you speak but from you experience not be the most liked person anymore do yes sp- i do speak from experience so you consciously rein in the politeness you consciously think i don't care whether yeah. you like me or not this needs to be said yes and i don't apologize for taking up people's time because their time is not more valuable than mine it takes me time to do things. It takes them time to do things. So I don't apologize for taking up their time for something that's necessary. That's a, I mean, you express it almost perfectly. Did, was there a, a, a pivot point? Did, was there a moment of realization? Or are you just looking back now and recognizing what you've described to me? No, I have the neighbors to thank for it because I worked in a European project and I worked with a lot of Dutch people and they are quite famously direct. And I was working with an experienced little bit, uh, a woman who was a bit older than me and she said, why do you always do that? Why do you always apologize to me? It's not you apologizing to me. You need to tell me this. I need to hear this so you don't need to apologize to this. I said, well, I'm I'm used to doing it. And she said, well, don't do it and certainly don't do it with men. <laughs> Can I ask how old you were at the time? This is fantastic. How old were you? Oh, I'm 40 now and yeah. when I, I, I was 32 when I met that colleague and she's been invaluable in my career. Well, clearly. Was... And, and in what way? How, I mean, how, how, if you had to, how would you describe well, the before, difference that like, it's made? Like to the your... situation I was, I was already doing the job for someone more senior than me, yeah. course, similar to someone spending years and I didn't get promoted. And um, I, I would always go like, you know, could you think about, you know, maybe cause yeah, I, I have yeah. been doing this for six years. And then after meeting her, I just went, I said, look, I've been doing this for five years already. If if, we, if there isn't a change six months from now, I'm leaving. This is it. No ifs or buts. And magically, my promotion came through two months later. So, I, I, Well, I think I don't think we're going to build on that. That's beautifully put. And, and interesting to bring sort of national characteristics into it as well. And, and as you speak about reframing the way you write emails or the way you address people. This We go back to this line from Helen McNamara, who was literally drawing attention to a life-and-death issue in the NHS during COVID, just when you thought you were out of the woods on annoying emails from me. That, that almost needs the Anne from Dendermonde treatment, that email. It could be like an algorithm that we put it through, and when it comes out the other side, it would not look a lot like... <laughs> it, looked like it looked like going in. Crikey. Thank you. I love this topic. I, I hope that you do too. I hope that men find it as interesting as I do, but, um, but I did promise to reveal. It's the worst reveal ever, this. But I swear to you, I've been saying for years, this is what you need to do. So you get a fancy bike, right? This is how did they find the biggest ever uh, bust of a, of a bike theft circle? How do you think they did it? You get a fancy bike, right? And everyone knows what the fancy bike is, the bike that all the thieves would want to steal. And you lock it up with a decent sort of angle grinder type lock so they don't get too suspicious. Uh, by angle grinder type lock, I mean a lock that would need an angle grinder to be broken off because the best thieves, uh, best thieves, but the most effective and prolific thieves have got angle grinders. And you put a tracker on it, a really good tracker, like inside the bar or something like that. So even if they did a quick scan, they wouldn't be able to find it. And that's how they did it. There's two pages in the Daily Mail today about the Sherlock Holmes of bike theft solving. And all they did was stick a tracker on a fancy bike, wait until it got nicked, and then follow it back to a scrap metal merchant somewhere in East London. And lo and behold, there was 130 grand's worth of bikes there. You can have that for nothing. That's it from me for another today. If you've missed any of the show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Tom Sorbrick with you at four, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC.